Good morning, Ian. We ask that you take your seats as we call our meeting to now to special presentations. Uh, I've read our first special presentation is our Above and Beyond Award. Uh, Dr. Ellis. Thank you. 
2021, Shreveport, Louisiana, experienced unprecedented snow and ice. Most of the nation watched as North Louisiana and surrounding areas were paused due to winter weather. Chancellor Ellis found it necessary to close our campus for the safety of our employees, and we at Southern began to work again from home. Now, although we were accustomed to a remote work environment, the snowstorm took a turn for the worse and caused down power lines and frozen water lines. Most of the northern Jaguar nation were now without power and water. I remember calling Chancellor Ellis and expressing to him how devastating it was going to be for our students not to be able to have their financial aid processed, and more importantly, refunds were not going to be able to be processed as our staff were without power, water, food, and internet. And additionally, 95% of the roads in Shreveport were completely impassable and unsafe to drive in regular vehicles. I just about assigned myself to the fact that once the snow melted, that we at Southern would be in yet another storm, a storm of angry students who desperately needed their money but would not receive it for several weeks due to the implement plan. Well, just like a knight in shining armor, a Jaguar knight in shining armor, a member of my team stepped up in a mighty way. Right before I was at home in the cold and just about to throw in my towel, Dr. Adam Jackson, Southern's assistant director for enrollment services and financial aid, takes me a selfie from in front of campus. He was not going to let our students down and your students down. Before I could say, go down, Moses, Southern's Jaguar, and shiny armor, Dr. Alan Jackson had a fever. He made his way to Southern's main campus by driving 17 miles one way on a four-wheeler, which took him over 45 minutes in freezing temperatures to the campus to process financial aid on his own. He located phone records to contact students to finalize their awards. And when asked, why did he go through all this trouble, he said, they're going through enough already. I just want to make sure they get their refunds. And once he spent a full day as the sole employee on campus other than our officers, working, he then got back on his four-wheeler, drove 17 miles home, 45 whole minutes. So today, on behalf of Chancellor Ellis, the administration, Mr. Jorge Sosa, my entire team, who are truly the best student affairs and enrollment management team assembled on this planet, but more importantly, on behalf of the students of Southern University at Shreveport, I want to publicly thank Dr. Dr. Alan Jackson for his service and for going above and beyond the call of duty. Dr. Dr. Ellis would also like to thank his wife, Jaleesa, for even allowing him to make such a dangerous journey on behalf of our students. I think she, she is here today as well. Ms. Jackson, Jackson, if you made it, she was trying to be sneaky and come after him. If you would please come forward if she is um, here already. If not, we'll, we'll continue. And now, Mr. Chair, per your personal request, because you did see that news article, he was featured on KSLA News and some other outlets, we humbly submit to you with the endorsement of President Belton and the other distinguished members of this board, the person of great fortitude in that of Dr. Allen Jackson. Yes, he is right here. Yes. There he is. Okay, he was hugging me, then he went away. <laughs> Would you like to make any comments, Alan? Um, this is truly a surprise. I was really, really not prepared for this. Uh, I just want to say thank you, um, Dr. Ellis, Dr. Melba, uh, Dr. So 
myself up. Uh, but really, the only thing that was on my mind sitting at home, um, many of our students are, as you know, low income, uh, zero IFC. Um, they are our neediest students, and they were dealing with enough, having to deal with COVID, <coughs> staying at home, um, trying to matriculate online. Um, a lot of them didn't have the technology needed to just sign up for class. So one thing I didn't want to do was have to send out emails saying that your refund would be delayed due to um, inclement weather. So I just did what I had to do, um, but I have a great team to support me. So it was me on campus, but it was also my team at home doing everything they can to make sure that the verification was done so that we could um, issue the awards accurately and efficiently. So I just want to thank my team and thank you guys for honoring us today. Thank you. Very good, and if you'll come forward, uh, Dr. Jackson, Dr. Williams, Dr. Ellis, and whomever else from your team, I'd also like to ask our Shreveport board members, uh, Mr. Hillard and Mr. Gillum, to join me in making the presentation and taking the photograph with Dr. Jackson. You'll come forward here. We can't go in the, in the middle. On behalf of the entire Southern University system, Dr. Jackson, we want to appreciatively acknowledge you, your work, and your efforts, and particularly, uh, as detailed by Dr. Williams, uh, your response to the critical situation, uh, weather-related, when you rose to the occasion and, and definitely went above and beyond. So we are very pleased to present to you this certificate, as well as this photograph. Thank you. So we'll come quickly where you want to go. Colleagues, uh, if there's no objection, uh, we are so very pleased to have uh, President Rick Gallo from Grambling State University uh, here with us this morning, uh, who greeted us at our last Bayou Classic. He was so gracious to join us at our reception last night, uh, and uh, we're so very proud and pleased to have him. He has been a partner with Southern University uh, in higher ed initiatives, and we're certainly appreciative of the collaborative nature in which he has uh, operated and the outstanding job that he's doing leading Grambling State University. So before we go to the Frank Taylor, because I know he has a busy day, uh, I would like to uh, go out of order and call him up now at this time to bring greetings. President Gallo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, uh, Dr. Belton, uh, thank you all so much for uh, inviting me back when, when Des Moines called and asked if I would be available to come and speak. I said, I can't believe you actually invited me back uh, <laughs> to, to speak to the board again. I, I absolutely appreciate uh, the honor. And to my former uh, Senate colleague, uh, Senator Amade, uh, certainly good to see you, Jody. I haven't seen him since we left Senate uh, service together. So, uh, you know, I just, I really feel at home in this room. Um, hopefully none of my folks a few miles down the road hear me say that. 
but but I really do, and and because our mission is the same, you know, we wear black and gold. You wear Columbia blue <laughs> and gold. Is that right? That's right. That's right. But at the end of the day, the the young men, the young women, who we are tasked to uh, impact in a positive way. Uh, is, is still the same. We still have the same mission. Is that, that is to make sure that we provide the best possible training for our graduates to go out and, and change the world. I had the opportunity to uh, preside over commencement already. Uh, we had ours on Wednesday and Thursday. And Governor John Bell Edwards was our uh, speaker on Wednesday. And I said to him, never in the state of Louisiana, uh, to my knowledge, has a sitting governor given his state of the state address on the campus of Southern University and then given the commencement address at Grambling on that Wednesday. I don't know that there's ever been a governor who has been so supportive of our HBCUs and of the students that we are tasked to serve. And so I think it is a special moment in time and I think that, uh, that we are up to the task of, of making sure that, that we do all we can to, uh, to work with Governor Edwards, and he has certainly been a, a great friend and supporter of, of Southern University and, and of Grambling. And, and I feel compelled to, to say this last thing, and I'm gonna get out of your way, because I know you have a lot of work to do. As we presided over the uh, commissioning ceremony of one of our ROTC cadets uh, on, on Wednesday, and you know, seeing the, the video images uh, that, that went viral over last weekend of um, a graduate of Virginia State University, a second lieutenant. And of course, Dr. Belton, we preside over those commissioning ceremonies every year. And to, to think that the young men and women that we are sending out into the world still have challenges that uh, quite frankly were uh, faced by, uh, by, by General Honore probably when he was a second lieutenant. <laughs> to think that our young men and women who are serving our country are still facing um, the, the, the hatred of racism in this country means that we have an even greater responsibility to make sure that those young men and those young women are prepared to go out and, and face this world and, and to make a change for the better. And so, uh, you know, for, for all of us who, who are tasked with doing this work, I know sometimes it's not easy and our supporters aren't always so supportive uh, in, the, in the tasks that we have to do, but it's important and we are changing people's lives and we have to continue to dig in, lean in, and, and do all we can uh, to, to make sure that our, our young people are prepared to go out and not just be a part of it, but to change the world. So uh, congratulations to Southern University uh, for all the great work that you continue to do. As the only HBCU system in the country, you are the envy of all HBCUs in the country. So uh, I suggest to you continue to do the great work that you do to lead uh, in this HBCU space. And uh, I'm certainly proud to be a graduate of Southern University and glad to see my chancellor, Chancellor Pierre here, and uh, all the great work that he continues to do as well. So God bless all of you and thank you again and welcome to North Louisiana. Thank you, thank you, President Gallo. And before you leave, if you will come forward, we've got a very special presentation that we're gonna go ahead and take up while you're here, which is item F, our Bayou Classic Signature Mask. Uh, Dr. Merrick or Dr. Belton, would you plan to facilitate this? I think Dr. Merrick. Okay, yeah, Dr. Merrick. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, honorable members of the board. Uh, President Gallo, thank you for being here with us this morning. We're excited to uh, announce our special signature Bayou Classic face mask in keeping with the 2021 Bayou Classic that is here in Shreveport uh, that would have been in New Orleans in 2020, but of course everything has changed. Uh, we want to unveil this mask today it's also part of our, the university's Don't Wait, Vaccinate public awareness campaign as it relates to vaccine participation amongst our communities. That's a great photo, Mr. President. Um, and we will have this mask available for all members of the board and those of you who are in the audience with us today. And we'll just take a moment of pride and just have a round of applause for this beautiful mask. <laughs> so
since we, since we have to wear them, and we don't mind wearing them, and I'm hoping that you will don this mask on tomorrow at the football game. It, of course, carries the colors of Columbia blue, as President Gallo mentioned, <coughs> and the Grambling black, and we share the gold in the middle. Thank you. Uh, President Gallo, they told me that that shadow box was for me, but I'm going to graciously give it to you, okay? <laughs> thank you again for coming, and thank you again for being here with us this morning. Uh, we'll go now back to item B, the Frank Taylor Memorial Scholarship. Mr. Gillum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, Mr. President, other board members, friends of Southern University, and, of course, this illustrious family that we're going to cite today for giving us Frank Taylor, Jr. Now, a little bit about Mr. Taylor, because he was a special individual. And I'm very thankful to the chairman when I asked him if we could indeed do this memorial presentation here today. He graciously said yes. So this family has um, offered and developed the Frank Taylor, Jr. Memorial Scholarship Fund in collaboration with the Southern University Shreveport Foundation. In fact, the family has come forth with a donation for this scholarship that is going to be matched by the Southern University Foundation here in Shreveport. But I must tell you a little bit of something about this extra, extra special young man. We lost this young man. He passed away this past summer. Now, there are some families that we call Southern University families. In other words, throughout the history of Southern there have been some families that have always sent their children to us. One of the sages and one of my mentors used to say, if you love Southern University, send your children to us. Well, that's what the, this family has done. We've got other families who've done the same thing. You know the names, some of the Bilberry family, the Ferdinand family, the Thomas Howard family here in Shreveport. This family is one of these. But to give you just a little bit of history, Frank wasn't the first member of this family to come. Everybody in this family has chosen to come to Southern University, and they've all graduated and gotten advanced degrees. Now, the first member of this family was the sister of Frank Taylor, Cheryl, who you're going to see in a moment. Now, back in the old days, when we recruited students, we recruited them almost like blue-chip athletes, Mr. Chairman. We had a college night out at Captain Shreve. Cheryl Taylor was there, but guess what? Her mother was there also. Not only did we have to convince Cheryl Taylor that Southern University in Shreveport and Southern University in Baton Rouge was the imminent place to attend, we also had to convince Mom. Well, she came to Southern University. Following her was indeed in 1980. Well, she got um, her agree from us in 1985. She had three other younger siblings who all followed her to Sussler here, and every last one of them has also obtained advanced degrees. Carla, Ms. Miss Freshman, Cynthia, I think they're all here today. They asked me how many people they could invite, Mr. Chairman. I told them, bring everybody. I did not realize we were going to be limited with space, but we do have a representative number of the family here. And I'll make this, I'll try to get through this, but this young man accomplished so much. He was a minister at the age of 17, <coughs> attended Southern University for two years. He also served on this illustrious Board of Supervisors in 2003. He went on to graduate from Southern University in Baton Rouge with a, a Bachelor of Science degree in Electronic Engineering Technology in 2007. And for 13 years hence, he was an electrical engineer who worked as a designer and a shipbuilder for the Defense Department and a government contractor by the name of Huntington Ingalls. Foremost, though, he is to be remembered as a mentor and an aspiration for students who were seeking careers in STEM. And as we move to the award here, as we ask Mr. Uh, Williams to come short moving forward with the award and the family. The Taylor family, as I said, developed a tradition. They went on with Jessica, with Crystal, 
They even have a first cousin who is currently at Southern University, I believe, <coughs> by the name of Levi Keith Brown. They have another first cousin, Harmony Brown. We are privileged and honored to have individuals like this. We don't have a lot of young people, especially young men, who we can present as an exemplary role model for our young people who are coming behind them. Frank Taylor Jr. was such an individual. May I ask at this time, would the family and uh, Mr. Williams, would you all come forth to make the presentation? Cheryl, come, Mama Taylor. And if you would, Chancellor, we want you to be on the standby to receive this illustrious award. Cheryl, would you, um, I believe you're the spokesperson for the family. The sister is, okay. Please come forward if you would allow me, Mr. Chairman, as we make this. Oh, you're gonna present it, Ms. Bell? Oh, please do. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Dottie Bell. I, I guess people know me, I don't know. Anyway, did bring back memories, Mr. Gillum, when I used to be around there for seven years on the board. The reason I'm here with the Teller family, Miss Teller called me and asked me that she wanted to, after her son passed, that she wanted to establish a scholarship in his name. And you know I just started hollering and screaming. So I said, yes, I met, uh, I got with, I told her to meet with Mr. Frank William over the foundation. And let me say a few things, Mr. Gillum already said a lot, but I need to say a few things about this young man. Mr. Lawson, Myron Lawson, Dr. Leon Tarver, and, and also uh, Frank, I mean, um, okay. Dr. Belton. They all served when I was on the board with this young man on the uh, Southern Board of Supervisors. And I never forget, I think his first flight, he was scared to fly, we had to fly somewhere, and he was scared that I think Sam helped him out. This was a, this young man was a diehard of Southern. But what happened, and it's emotional, when she called me and told me he had passed away, and then she said, I want to do something in his name. And this is what you've done. Let me say a few things about him. Um, what he did to support, to say that I am a Southern grad. He attended elementary and middle school in Cattle Parish, as you know, and I am a school board member with Cattle Parish. Mr. Taylor confessed his calling at the age of 17 and became a minister. He graduated from Captain Shreve High School in 2002. While, while ready to embark upon the higher education world, he attended Southern University at Shreveport. During his two years at Sussler, he became a freshman class president, student government president, and a member of the Southern University Board of Supervisors. Mr. Teller received a social applied science in electronic and technology. After completing the studies at Sussler, Mr. Teller received a Bachelor of Science in Electronic Engineering Technology from Southern University A M College in Baton Rouge. Now his career was this. His career spanned over 13 years as an electrical engineer. He was a shipbuilder for the Department of Defense. He had a kind heart and was a mentor to others seeking careers in the STEM field. And the reason I'm here with them today because they want to give back. And this is what we need to have all our young people to know. The historic black colleges are there for them. And when she told me that, I said, look, we, got, we talked to Mr. Gillum. As I went through Frank, and Frank said, okay, we went to Mr. Gillum. This is something that need, this is the things that need to be in the world today on the front page of the paper. This is what we're talking about, giving back. So today, and Mr. Gillum, can I do that? I have to follow lead with him. I like to, we like to present, and the family would like to present their first $5,000 in his name of um, Frank Teller Junior Memorial Scholarship. And they're going to present this uh, part of the uh, scholarship every, uh, every year to students at Southern University in Shreveport. And 
and I must brag, Jessica was my student in school, so you know I did a good job, okay? It's kind of impromptu for me, but I would just like to thank everyone here for their support of my brother. He loves Southern University. Um, he loved his members. He loved the school. Um, he was my mentor after he went into electrical engineering. I went into electrical engineering, so it's, he is near and dear to my heart, and we just want to keep his legacy alive, and we appreciate the Southern University Board for um, loving our family and providing such a, a great for career for my brother and helping him to advance. Um, he often talked about Professor Warner Brown, um, Pastor Hudson, as, as his mentors. I went on to um, be taught by both of them as well, and we love Southern University, and we really appreciate um, the efforts and everything. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't, uh, Dr. Ellis, why don't you come and receive the check? <laughs> Would you? Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gillum, did that conclude your, did you have? We have, uh, if you would allow me, just a yes, sir. point of personal privilege. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for your yes. consideration. Uh, we also have two other awards, I believe, coming from the uh, local foundation, and that's the uh, Carl Pearson family. Are they here, Mr. Wimmer? Come forward and uh, sleeves, if you will. Now, most of you, will, if you've been around long enough, will remember the contribution of Carl Pearson. He's a, um, a strong graduate uh, of Southern University football, former football player, and was also a supervisor of athletics here in Kettle Parish Schools. We have before us today his lovely wife, Ms. Pearson, and I believe this is his son, yes. Carl Pearson Jr., yes. went on, had a stellar career at another SWAC school, I believe, but am I right? Uh, no, that was my brother. That was your brother? Yes. Okay, I remember the name. Uh, but anyway, we'll have you come forth, uh, Mr. Williams, and make that uh, award, that scholarship award. Thank you, Mr. Gilliam. Uh, I had a formal presentation. Other than that, I'd like to devi deviate from that and just present them uh, this particular check. What's unusual about this is that once uh, Mr. Pearson passed, at that point, Mrs. Pearson decided that she wanted to pay tribute to him on an ongoing basis. She went out, she raised some money, and the foundation at Sri Report decided that we would match those dollars. Today, we're happy to present to the chancellor, Dr. Ellis, would you please come forward, uh, a check in the amount of $13,000, if I can remember, to the school, recognizing that this is the first of probably an annual installment for the school. At this point, I would like to introduce Ms. Mrs. Pearson and she will say a few words and then I will make the rest of my presentation. Good morning. Good morning. It is indeed my pleasure to be here. Um, we are Southern Knights. Uh, we have four Southern Knight graduates in our family. So it is indeed our pleasure to continue Carl's legacy. He loves Southern. We are supporters. We are season ticket holders. 
and we look forward to awarding um, scholarships to future students. And I might add that Jessica Taylor was one of the persons that Carl was responsible for awarding a scholarship on the national level. So it was great to see uh, her today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, we are loading the uh, chancellor up here today. Uh, he's going to make a regular check with, uh, in fact, if you'll notice on the agenda today, uh, we have another award from the uh, Shreveport Foundation Board to the scholarship fund for Shreveport. Thank you, Mrs. Gill. To Chancellor Honorable Damone Rutledge, Vice Chancellor Reverend Samuel Tarbert, President Dr. Ray Belton, President Emeritus, Dr. Leon Tarbert, and board members. I would probably be amiss if I did not acknowledge two of my former colleagues, Mr. Myron Lawson and Mayor Dr. Leroy Davis. We go a long, long way back, and I'd just like to say hi to them. The foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that was founded in 1999. We have 18 board members, of which six are here today. Mr. Sam Gilliam, Honorable Sam Gilliam, he's one of our members. Mr. Wendell Piper, I'd like him to come forward. He's the president. Mrs. Dottie Bell, you've already heard from her. Mrs. Jean Mosley, she's here today, and I think she'll take part in another presentation. And Ms. I'm sorry, att Attorney Akiva Johnson. I don't know whether she's made it here yet. And my trusted assistant, Ms. Emily Owens, I don't know whether she's made it here yet. The foundation's primary purpose is to raise funds for student scholarships. We as a board are extremely pleased today to present to Dr. Ellis a check in the amount of $83,500 for the purpose of various things that I will not go into at this particular time. But I will say that at the particular time, we feel that we could do more. And thinking about it, we have decided that at our Port City Classic, which we have every year, we are going to give the check, give the chancellor, I'm sorry, Another check in the amount of $12,500, which will bring our contribution to $100,000 for the year of 2001, and in which we will sit and discuss how we go forward and make an annual presentation of that or more each year. So at this particular time, I'd like to present the check and those board members to come forward that are here to Dr. Ellis and so that he can deal with that as he sees fit. I serve on the board too, because I love Southern. This is what we're giving the 80. $83,500. We're giving it, Dr. Ellis, we're giving you $40,000 for student scholarships, $10,000 for dual enrollment. The Chancellor Gap Fund, fund, fund funding is $2,000. $2,000 for student textbooks, $20,000 for university enhancement, and $1,500 for miscellaneous. And this is what we work hard for the golf tournament, everything we do. And I just want to thank Mr. Frank William. He is a fundraiser. 
He's a good board person, a CEO. So I want y'all to give him a hand because he worked hard. And I feel good now. We gonna, I, wanted, I told him, I said, we need to make 100,000. So we're making 100,000. Thank you to Sussman. Okay, Mr. Gillum. All right. Make no apologies. The mic is always open to receive some money, so we, <laughs> cer <laughs> we certainly appreciate uh, the leadership that you've provided, as well as those persons uh, who have come forward uh, to make uh, substantive, uh, substantial rather, uh, donations uh, to Southern University of Shreveport. We go now to uh, items C and D, which both will be handled, I'm told, by Dr. Robin Merrick, the Billy Jones donation, and the SU Army ROTC. Dr. Merrick? Good morning again, Mr. Morning. Chairman, Mr. President, honorable members of the board. Um, we are excited to be in the line this morning of contributions to the university. And we are here now to present the Billy Francis Jones, B sorry, Billy Francis Stoves Jones Scholarship. Mrs. Jones was a 1954 graduate of Booker T. High School here in Shreveport. She was a 1959 graduate of Southern University and A&M College in Baton Rouge. She became an educator in the Caddo community and as a generous alumnus who loved her alma mater and wanted to leave a generous uh, gift to us upon her passing. Today I would like to welcome Shreveport City Court Judge Shiva Sims and Attorney Felicia Hamilton to present a contribution to SUBR, not Susla, Dr. Ellis, sorry, on behalf of the late Billy Francis Stoves Jones. Chair and board. Good morning. I am attorney Felicia Hamilton, the owner of the law offices of Felicia M. Hamilton LLC, located here in Shreveport, Louisiana. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to be here today. I had the pleasure of representing Billy Francis Stoves Jones for estate planning purposes. Ms. Jones, as you've heard, was a native of Shreveport, Louisiana. She was born March 21st, 1936. She matriculated at Purdue, Governor State University in Illinois, Michigan State, and Chicago State. She was a 1954 graduate of Booker T. Washington High School here in Shreveport, and as you heard, a 1959 graduate of Southern University Baton Rouge, where she received a Bachelor of Science degree in secondary education. She was an energetic, retired educator. You know how educators are. She was a spry little old lady. And in her final days, she asked me to come to the facility where we had previously already done her will, but she asked me to come because she wanted to make some changes to the will we'd already prepared. It was at that time that she do decided that she wanted to donate to her beloved Southern University, Baton Rouge. Ms. Jones passed on September 28, 2019 at the age of 83. I am pleased to present a check in the amount of $21,500 for five $4,000 scholarships to African American students, juniors or seniors from Shreveport, Louisiana, majoring in secondary education, with the remaining $1,500 put in the discretionary fund to be used at the directive of the chair. And may the memory of Billy Francis, the chair and president, I apologize, <laughs> May the memory of Billy Francis Stoves Jones live on in future educators. Thank you. Thank you. So we would ask uh, Mr. President if you would come forth, Mr. Chairman, uh, to take the photograph with Attorney Hamilton, along with Dr. Sahu, representing academic affairs for the SUBR campus. And Mr. Gilliam, if you would like, as well as a member of the board from Shreveport, and Mr. Hilliard, if you would join us. Uh, we are very grateful for Mrs. Jones's contribution to the university.
Mr. Chairman, are you ready to proceed with yes. the next item on the agenda? Yes, ma'am. So traditionally, the Southern University Army ROTC Jaguar Battalion runs the Bayou Classic game football from Baton Rouge to New Orleans. Well, this year, things are a bit different, and everything has been different for us over the last year or so. Joining us by Zoom right now is Lieutenant Colonel David Marshall. He's the commander of the Jaguar Battalion and professor of military science at SUBR. He's united with his counterpart at Grambling State University. And beginning at 5 a.m. this morning, we are making history as the Bayou Classic game football for the first time is being run from Grambling State University to Shreveport by both the Southern University and the Grambling State University Army ROTC units. The cadets are there. This run takes about seven and a half hours, so they should be about a little past the midway point. But we'd like to introduce you now to Lieut Lieutenant Colonel Marshall live from this historic run. And we're hey, thank you, Dr. Mayor. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Lieutenant Colonel David Marshall, Professor of Military Science at Southern University. I have my good friend with me, Lieutenant Colonel Mason Moore from Grambling State University. Uh, we're executing our Bayou Classic ball run today. This is actually the first time that we had an opportunity to do this. No, the weather is not cooperating with us, but we're over halfway there. We just crossed into Minden, so we've been running for about five hours and we have about three more hours to go. Uh, we have a total of 60 cadets, and they're excited to be participating in this momentous occasion. So I'll turn it over to Colonel Moore. And we have a uh, saying in the Army, if it ain't raining, we ain't training. And so boy, do we have plenty of rain today. Um, this venture is truly symbolic of uh, how we operate in the military, and that's jointly. So um, it's a, indeed a pleasure for well myself and uh, Colonel Parker to be out here today. And as you can see here, um, we truly have a big caravan uh, coming up behind us with our uh, fired up cadets. Yeah, let's go, let's go. Almost there, almost we have there. A cadet ready for us. So we have four state troopers with us. We have a huge charter bus to make sure that all the cadets are comfortable. Each cadet is running about nearly one mile. So once the cadet runs that one mile, they jump back onto the bus, and then we exchange the football and exchange cadets. We give that cadet a rest, and then we continue on. And we'll do this until we get to Independence Stadium. Yeah. So many thanks to my staff, my Southern University staff. Many thanks to Colonel Moore and his staff. And lastly, Dr. Mary, thank you for everything that you've done for me. I know that I've been a little bit of a pinch trying to get this exposed, but this is a very, very special occasion for us. And we want to make sure that we get the exposure that it deserves. So thank you very much. Go Jags, and hope to see some of you all tomorrow. All right. All right. Very good. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes that presentation. Thank you. Uh, Members, Dr. Belton leaned over and told me that uh, he would have participated in the run this morning, but for uh, our meeting. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're almost done with our presentations. You have to have a board meeting. Before we go to our check presentations, I see uh, Mr. John Belton, who is the district attorney for the third judicial district in Louisiana and a former distinguished uh, chairman of the Southern University Board of Supervisors. We're so very happy to have him with us this morning. Thank you for joining us. We'll go now to our check presentations uh, from the McDonald's. I believe these are all Dr. Ellis. Dr. Dr. Ellis? Good morning again. Um, 
I'd like to get this started, but I'm going to have uh, my chief advancement officer, uh, Stephanie Rogers, follow me with uh, more details about what this is actually about. Um, but about uh, three years ago, I uh, charged the business studies department with really evaluating itself uh, in an effort to try to come up with innovative ways uh, to improve um, the outcomes for that department, as well as ways to incentivize faculty and students. Um, quickly, they put that together and then subsequently came up with a strategic plan to use the, that assessment in order to put a plan of action in place. And so before I get started, I'd like to recognize uh, our business studies department if they are here in the audience, uh, Dr. Regina Webb, Mr. Alwyn Holman, if they'll stand up. So today is really about how to fulfill the strategic plan. Um, a very uh, important person, I would say, in this community who's had a long-standing relationship with Southern for over a decade um, will be making a presentation and will be telling you why uh, this is so important when uh, Ms. Rogers comes up. But this gentleman um, has contributed a lot of time, money, equipment, effort into Southern University of Shreveport for over a decade. And uh, we felt in our hearts that no one else in this community could really represent the business department like this particular individual. Uh, when I first got to Shreveport about five years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting him and just sitting down talking to him. And he truly is the epitome of the American dream. Uh, but most importantly, I, I say the epitome of the African American dream because he is an inspiration to all of us, definitely me, and to those of us that aspire to be more than what we thought we ever could be. And so in that, in his power, in uh, his fame, in his influence in this community, he, re he remains probably the most humble and kind people that I've ever met since I've been here in Shreveport. And so I think it's very important, and I, I go back to my grandma, she says, no matter how big you get, boy, treat everybody the same. And that's what I think about this gentleman. So I'm gonna have Stephanie Rogers come up here and do an in-depth in presentation and uh, give you a little bit more details uh, about this gentleman. Good morning. Mr. Chair, President Belton, distinguished members, hon honorable members of the board, Jaguar fans, family, friends, faculty, and staff. Dr. Ellis, I want to thank you, first of all, for your leadership and for your vision on this initiative. Dr. Terry Kidd and his business department team, led by Dr. Barry Hester, and especially Dr. Regina Webb, Mr. Alwyn Holman, and Mr. George Lewis, a longtime instructor who could not be here with us today, uh, for their support and for laying out a strategic plan to move the business department forward with a solid plan, strategic plan, and goals to increase capacity for Southern University at Shreveport, provide for the needs of the business department students, faculty, and staff, and for the long-term viability and sustainability of Southern University at Shreveport. We're grateful to the state of Louisiana and your leadership for the funds that you appropriate to us each year to operate at Southern University at Shreveport. We do feel, however, that it's incumbent upon us to maximize the impact of those dollars by leveraging it to the best of our ability with private dollars and partnerships. Today is an indication of that. Let's see. 
I'm clicking, but it's not. <laughs> So part of that, just a quick glimpse of what that strategic plan includes, is it's designed with instruction models for impact learning, state-of-the-art business software, a business think tank for students to where they can brainstorm and have brainstorming sessions built in to those classes, real-world real business leader mentors, they can earn while they learn with internships, paid internships, associate degrees, and certificates earned quickly so they can get a job, go to work, and earn above minimum uh, wage living uh, in careers of high demand. And so that Southern University as Shreveport students, similar to what we witness here today, what we witness all over the country, and what we witness every year as those students graduate and go out into the world, similar to what we're witnessing with those alums sitting around the table today, so that Southern University at Shreveport business students can be ready to successfully compete on a global platform, as Dr. Webb said in her strategic plan. So we're pleased to announce a campaign goal of $2 million associated with the initiative that we're about to, uh, of the person that we're about to introduce to you today. In order to do something like this, you know that we cannot do it alone. With your support and that of Dr. Ellis and those that we mentioned, we assembled a team, a dynamic team consisting of Ms. Jean Mosley. She is the PR manager from Griggs Enterprise Inc. Please stand, Ms. Jean. <laughs> Mr. David Aubrey, the regional vice president for AT&T. David, are you here? There he is. <laughs> These are the co-chairs. The leadership and organization team also consists of Mr. Denson Bates with Griggs Enterprise. Mr. Bates. Of course, our own Dr. Rodney Ellis leading the charge, Dr. Terry Kidd, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Workforce Development, Dr. Antonius Pegues, Vice Chancellor for Finance. Uh, you've already uh, heard about Dr. Regina Webb, Mr. Allen Holman, and myself, of course. Who is Mr. Roy Griggs? For nearly four decades, Mr. Griggs has pushed past socioeconomic barriers to not only build a lucrative career for himself and his family, but he's also mentored many others toward professional and personal success. As a philanthropist, Mr. Roy Griggs generously shares his earnings to support those in need and to improve his community. He contributes to the economic growth and stability of the region by employing as many as 700 citizens at his 14 restaurants throughout Northwest Louisiana and one in East Texas. Over the years, Mr. Griggs has persevered through some of the most challenging business and economic times, and of course, including the unprecedented pandemic. To sustain these businesses and even grow them in the midst of these challenges, and to sustain the livelihoods of his employees, citizens of Northwest Louisiana, and students of Southern University at Shreveport. He's not only a family man, deeply committed to his wife, Nelva, his four kids, seven grandkids, his family, siblings, and friends. Many are here today. Mr. Griggs is a servant whose faith is deeply rooted in service to others. Over the years, he's gone about answering that call to serve quietly without seeking public acclaim. Now, not only has he committed to serve, his philosophy is that those in his employ will serve as well. So they serve on various boards, they participate in civic and community activities, and they volunteer at Southern University often. His contributions to Southern University, to the uh, community, are well noted. You may have seen Mr. Griggs' photo in the lobby 
of this very convention center when you walked in. If you did not, please take a look on the wall when you walk out. You cannot miss him. He's the only one who looks like us. Mr. Griggs is the largest African-American McDonald's franchise owner in Susla service area. The Roy Griggs success, the Roy Griggs story is an American success story. He was recently honored during Black History Month by the local media. But in giving back to the community, Mr. Griggs has contributed over $633,662 to Southern University at Shreveport over the years. Directly and indirectly, he won the largest incumbent worker training grant of any African-American business in the state at that time in 2004, led by Ms. Janice Sneed and her team in workforce development. In addition to that, he stepped up today to help transform Southern University students and the business department so that Southern University of Shreveport is not going. Southern University of Shreveport is growing and will be here. Okay, I'm told the volume is not coming up, but that's all right. Don't take our word for it. I'd like for you to hear from the man himself. Ladies and gentlemen, um, please help me welcome to the podium Mr. Roy Griggs, President and CEO of McDonald of Griggs Enterprise doing business as McDonald's. Along with him, I'd like to invite Ms. his wife, Ms. Nelba Griggs, to come up, along with Ms. Jean and David Aubrey. Please come to the podium. Good morning. After that wonderful intro, I don't have words to express how I feel at this moment. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, first let me say, uh, to Chairman uh, Rutledge, uh, President Belton, Chancellor Ellis, and to the Board of Supervisors here, I am deeply honored, appreciative of all of the kind remarks that have been said about Roy Griggs. But this story is not about Roy Griggs. I stand on the shoulder of so many great giants that have come before me. I'm surrounded by such a great team at Griggs Enterprise, and it always appears like Roy Griggs gets all the accolades, but it goes to that great team that support me each and every day. Today, I'm equally excited. I have my wife with me today. I have my family here from Meridian, Mississippi. Would y'all please stand at this time? I have my home pastor here from Meridian who drove to be with us today. Thank you for that. And to uh, Mrs. Rogers and the team, Mrs. Mosley, my public relations, Denson Bates, chief operating officer, who worked so hard to make this possible. I, I just thank them so much. And, and to Southern, this has been a beautiful uh, relationship. We've been working down through the years. A great institution, uh, a great, uh, like I say, working relationship, and proud to be a part of this organization. And uh, it is my hope and my prayer 
that we can continue to help this community by working with our Southern University of Shreveport to become a even better place to educate our youth of this community and around this nation that wants to come and get a great education right here in Shreveport, Louisiana. So again, thank you so much, Mrs. Rogers and the team that worked so hard uh, to put this together. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm just so humble and appreciative uh, because I'm so, I know there's so many more who are doing great things that you could have uh, chosen and to pick or select a little country boy from Meridian, Mississippi, from the Red Hills of Mississippi. Uh, I'm just really appreciative of that. So thank you so much. <laughs> No, thank you, Mr. Griggs. Thanks to all of your family. As I just have to reiterate, many of them drove in, like he said, to be here for this. And the reason for that is because he has graciously, he and his family wanted to show Southern University at Shreveport and the Southern University Board, Governing Board, that they are wholeheartedly behind this effort and he has agreed to lend his name to this effort. What does that mean? I'd like to call Dr. Ellis up to help with this. Members of the family, please come up as well. And Dr. Regina Webb and Mr. Owen Holman, please come up. Mr. Griggs, in addition to pledging, uh, in addition to doing what he's already done, he said not only, not only, well, I give it everything I've got. And he has been doing that to make sure we reach this goal. He said, I'm going to step up. I'm going to do the, he didn't say step up. He said, I'm going to make my pledge first. Mr. Griggs has pledged an initial, an initial seed gift of his own of $250,000. And Mr. Chair, Mr. President, thank you for indulging us. We would also like to get a photo of you and uh, the uh, Mr. Chair and Mr. President with uh, the Griggs family. They are so honored uh, by this opportunity to serve. <laughs> I understand that Mr. Jonathan Reynolds uh, is in the audience. We'd like to ask him to come up as well from Carter Federal Credit Union, and you'll see why in a moment. Oh, he's already here. <laughs> Mr. Gilliam and Mr. Hilliard. We'd like to respect, we respectfully request for you to come up and join this effort. Mr. Gillum and Mr. Hilliard. Thank you for bearing with us just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, while that is, that photo is being taken, please allow me to go ahead and share with you that during the silent phase of this initiative, when we gathered 
our champions together and we gathered uh, information and we started sharing information, other businesses stepped up to say, Mr. Roy Griggs uh, is an honorable man. This is long overdue. We want to be a part of this effort. We have certified pledges of an additional $250,000 in matching gifts to this effort, yes. Those gifts were matched by Carter Federal Credit Union, Home Federal Bank, Mr. John Atkins of Atco Investments and other friends of Mr. Roy Griggs. Please join with me in giving them a round of applause. concludes our presentation, ladies and gentlemen. We just want to thank you. Okay, I think, does that, Dr. Ellis, does that conclude your presentations? You have one more? Okay. We have uh, one more. Unfortunately, uh, the Precious Memories uh, donor could not be here today. Something came up. But we do have uh, one last check presentation from the Susla alumni. About uh, three or four years ago, a group of individuals, uh, Tony Williams, Tina Williams, Tashina Williams, James Brown, and uh, some others came together to, to help us uh, create uh, and initiate the uh, Susla Alumni uh, Association. And so they have been so supportive of this institution, our students, since that time. And uh, we have uh, Mr. James Brown here to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Ellis, uh, to the board chair, Mr. President. Uh, I think it's January the 11th, 2018. We assemble over at the conference room uh, with Dr. Ellis, Tony Williams, I thank the ultimate multitasker, Dr. Melva Williams, and, uh, and also Ms. Stephanie Rogers, and we hammered out a plan to organize the Susla alumni. Uh, they asked me to come in because of my 50 years of active experience uh, with, the, with the alumni. Uh, we left that meeting uh, with a commitment to Fundraising, not fun, but fund, F-U-N-F-U-N-D. The difference in the two words is the D, the dollar. So we're here today, uh, Dr. Ellis, uh, to present you a second check from the Susla alumni. And I present this check to you uh, in the spirit of my mother, who took me to the train station the fourth Sunday in August, 1965, leaving Mr. Paul Slack's plantation, my little suitcase wrapped in duct tape, the rest of my clothes in a pillow place. My mother reached in her bosom, pulled out a crumpled up $5 bill. She said, this is all I got, but all you need is this crumpled up $5 bill, and you take the Lord along with you everywhere you go. Uh, that worked, because four years later, I had five job offers, and uh, some 
few years ago, I was a celebrated accountant as I retired from Texaco uh, Incorporated. So Dr. Ellis, uh, we were the Sussler alumni on behalf of our president, uh, Steve Thomas, asked me to come by and make the presentation. I'd like to present you with a $20,000 check. Uh, I'd like to say uh, that Not, not only the $20,000 check, I also brought you a crumpled up $5 bill. <laughs> and you take the Lord along with you everywhere you go, and the Lord will bless you real good. I say the Lord will bless you real good, Dr. I listen to the rest of you, because uh, God is a jaguar. Why else would he make the sky Columbia blue and the sunset gold? And he even thought enough of us to make the first day of the week begin with SU. <laughs> God bless you real good. And uh, this is one of many checks that we plan to present you on behalf of Steve Thomas and the Sussler alumni. Thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Reverend Brown, and thank you, Dr. Ellis. Uh, I believe all of my board members are back because we're going to start with our agenda. Uh, we certainly... Uh, are appreciate your patience uh, and uh, this is a once in a lifetime e event here in Shreveport. Ed Shorty leaned over to me and said he's going to have to go back to New Orleans and start raising some money because <laughs> he thinks they want to come back here in November. Uh, so we'll go now to the action items on our agenda members. We're going to try to take some of the routine items up in uh, global uh, clearly to the extent there's a question a concern about any item by a board member, we will take that matter up in the order in which it is presented. So we'll know, oh, I'm sorry, I was told that we've got some uh, student uh, representatives here from our SGA, um, the newly elected SGA president from Southern University of Baton Rouge, Kevin Jarrell, and the immediate past uh, president, uh, Chandler Vedrine. Are they still here? Out of here. Very good. Welcome. And I believe some of the members of your cabinet are here. Would you please stand? Thank you. Thank you for being here. All right. We'll go now to action item 8A, uh, approval of the minutes of the March 12, 2021 virtual meeting of the Southern University Board of Supervisors. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. It's been moved by Dr. Tarvin, seconded by Mr. Bartholomew. Is there any objection? to the approval of the minutes. Hearing none, the minutes stand approved. Next members will take up items B through E, B through E. Certification of spring 2021 20, graduates from SUBR, Suno, Susla, and the Southern University Law Center. Item C, request approval to approve the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters to Mr. J. Terrell Brown, coming from the Southern University College of Business at SUBR. Item D, request approval for the conferral of a posthumous degree in the name of William Neighbors from the Southern University Law Center. And item E, request approval of Mrs. Gail Benson as commencement speaker and awarding of the Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters from Southern University at New Orleans College of Business and Public Administration. Um, so moved. It's been moved by Mr. Bartholomew and I believe seconded by Ms. Reeves. Uh, any objection to uh, these items being approved? Any objections? Hearing none, those items stand approved. Chancellors, for either of the, any of these items, do you wish to add anything? Chancellor Pierre. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to thank the board uh, on behalf of the neighbors family. Uh, <laughs> Bill Neighbors uh, died as a result of a vehicular accident on April 2nd, 2021, two, two weeks ago. Uh, and he was a fantastic student, non-traditional. Mr. Neighbors would have been 60 years old in September. Uh, and he was so excited about be, be, being at the Law Center. And we were able to come last week uh, for his uh, homegoing service in Mansfield, Louisiana. He had an insurance agency here in Shreveport. And uh, his family is grateful to the board for uh, conferring this degree in the manner. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you. You can share with me. Can I say something? Absolutely, Mr. Garvey. I also was a classmate of Bill Neighbors, and um, it was sad to see him because he was in my tax class, and so uh, it's very hard. And I served with him on Lexus Nexus table, um, got to sit with him, and he experienced his life experiences, um, just a, full of energy at his, at his, at his wisdom age. Um, and it was very a tragedy to see him go. It was the SBA and both student body at SULC has a vigil coming up in his place um, for, for, for Mr. Bill Neighbors um, that we're, we're coordinating with student body and um, organizations here on campus. But um, I'm glad that we were able to approve his Fort Thomas Lee degree. Um, he will be definitely missed but never forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we certainly will keep Mr. Neighbors' his family in our thoughts and prayers. Mr. I'm, Chairman. Yes. Oh. I'm sorry. Yes, Dr. Ammons. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, to uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Vice Chair, members of the board, uh, President Belton. Um, I want to enthusiastically uh, recommend uh, the awarding of the Doctor of Humane Letters to Mrs. Gail Benson. Uh, as you know, uh, she and her late husband, uh, Tom Benson, who passed away in 2018, uh, are the current owners of the New Orleans Saints. They've owned that franchise since 1985, and the New Orleans Pelicans of the NBA since uh, 2012. Uh, Mrs. Benson uh, has agreed to serve as the commencement uh, speaker uh, for our spring uh, commencement. Uh, she is a native of New Orleans and an accomplished business professional and philanthropist. Uh, she and her husband, uh, Tom Benson, worked together to build these two championship level organizations while making a positive impact in the New Orleans community. Philanthropic giving and community investment have been the hallmarks of Mrs. Benson's ownership of the Saints and the Pelicans. And she has definitely enriched the New Orleans community through her support for causes in health and wellness, cancer care, education, arts, and faith-based sectors. Yes, sir. I, I'm not sure if you're aware, Dr. Ambers, the item has been approved. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, I just wanted to. Oh, sure. uh, I, I wanted to say something. Okay, uh, go ahead, please. I, go ahead, finish, please. No, I'm, I'm finished. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Well, Chairman, may I? Just yes, Dr. Sahu. I'll be brief. I think it's an opportunity to recognize um, Mr. J. Terrell Brown, who you have just approved for an honorary degree. Um, what's really distinguishing about him, he's a Louisiana native. But at Southern University, he established the first endowed chair, uh, not in his own name, but uh, in the name of then Ambassador James A. Joseph. And his contribution to business is very well known in the community, but uh, he's a community leader. And that's what, and his care and concern for small business, minority entrepreneurship is what we are recognizing today. And your approval we express our gratitude from the College of Business and from Southern University. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll go back to Dr. Ammons. You, you began by saying you recommended approval. I just wanted to make sure you were aware that the item had been approved. I didn't mean to cut you off. If you'd like to complete your, your remarks, I'd be more than happy to yield to you to do so. No, no, I just wanted to okay. uh, you know, express uh, how enthusiastically uh, I made the recommendation yes, sir. Uh, for the approval All right. uh, of the degree. Thank you so much. Uh, you. I'm told that the clerk of court for uh, Caddo Parish, Mr. Mike Spence, is with us this morning. Mr. Spence, if you'll stand to be recognized, thank you for joining us today. Okay, we'll go now to items F through I. I do know that there is uh, a presentation uh, on item F, which will be coming from Dr. Albert Samuels, who chairs the public policy uh, department at Southern University of Baton Rouge, and I believe we have a family member who will be joining us virtually to request approval to establish the Southern University Antium College Jewel Lamar Prestige.
Public Policy Polling and Research Center. Item G, request approval of a memorandum of understanding between the Southern University Agricultural Research and Extension, Extension Center and Black Farmers Hemp Research and Training Facility, LLC. Request approval of a memorandum of understanding between the Southern University Agriculture, Family and Consumer Sciences, 1890 JAG Star Scholarship in East Baton Rouge Parish School System. And item I, request approval of a memorandum of understanding between LSU Health Shreveport School of Medicine, MOU with SUBR and Southern University at New Orleans. That's items F through I. Uh, before we uh, move on to items, uh, any additional comments on either of them from any of the chancellors? All right, is there a motion? So moved. Oh, Mo moved by Dr. Tarver, seconded by Mr. Bartholomew. Uh, any objection? Hearing none, the item stands approved. We'll now recognize Dr. Samuels for the presentation on item F. First of all, good morning. Uh, uh, to uh, President Chancellor Belton, uh, uh, the Honorable Chair, uh, Mr. Jamon Rutledge, uh, Honorable Members of the uh, Southern University Board of Supervisors, uh, and to all the members of the Jaguar family, uh, I have the I have the uh, the task of sharing with you some brief remarks about our proposal to. Uh, established the Jewel Lamar Precious uh, Public uh, Policy, Polling, and uh, Research Center. And then following that, there will be a, 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 an opportunity of a, a brief word from one of the family members of, of, of Dr. Precious who will also make a brief statement. The Jewel Lamar Precious Public Policy <coughs> Polling Research Center basically exists to foster the production of scholarly and polling research to disseminate those findings to inform a public policy, to promote civic engagement, and to provide practical, hands-on experiences that will equip our students uh, to be competitive uh, in the marketplace. Now, the Prestige Center aligns with uh, both the mission of Southern University a and College and also the, 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 the mission of the Department of Political Science and History. Uh, I, don't, I don't go into too much detail here, but the, obviously the mission of our university is to provide opportunities to, for a diverse uh, student population to achieve a high quality global educational experience, to engage in scholarly research uh, and creative activities, and to give meaningful uh, public uh, service to the community, state, and nation, and the world so that our students, are, our graduates, are competent, informed, and productive citizens. This also aligns with the mission of the Department of Political Science and History, to, which seeks to produce citizens who are well-versed in the substantive contents of the disciplines of political science and history, and to prepare them to, for careers in public service and the private sector and to promote the values consistent with civic engagement and global citizenship. Now, this center is a, uh, a tribute to its namesake, 
uh, Dr. Jewel Lamar Prestich, who is a native of Pineville, Louisiana. Uh, Jewel Lamar Prestich is a, is a 1951 graduate of Southern University in the NM College in political science. Uh, a few short years later, she uh, went on to be able to become the first African woman to receive a PhD in political science in the United States from the University of, of Iowa. Uh, she served uh, 33 years of service at Southern University as, as a faculty member, as a department chair, and the founding dean of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. Uh, she was also married to uh, uh, James Prestish, the former uh, chancellor of Southern University, uh, who is still uh, 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 residing in Houston, Texas, and is excited about uh, this honor that we are uh, on the, the cusp of, of bestowing upon uh, his departed wife. Uh, all she did was inspire and mentor more African Americans to get their PhDs in political science than any other individual. And I say she is still, from her perch in heaven, inspiring people to go into political science. The, uh, the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute, uh, which, which started at Southern University, but now another institution, that was her idea. So she is still uh, inspiring uh, African Americans to go into political science. In addition to all the lawyers and judges and uh, politicians and other leaders uh, who have come out of the Department of Political Science. Uh, she's also one of the founding members of the of, of, uh, National Conference of Black Political Scientists. Now, this center is needed to devote special attention to issues that impact African Americans, uh, disadvantaged communities of color. Uh, this is particularly uh, timely in light of the reactionary political environment that we find ourselves in. Uh, where there are those who are intent upon nullifying uh, the gains of the civil rights movement. And so this could also help us provide the basis for the development of policies that are applicable to the challenges of communities of color uh, and to produce students with the practical skills and research and data analysis that can translate those skills in ways that can serve disadvantaged uh, communities. The location of the Jewel Precious Center will be in Higgins Hall, uh, uh, right in Higgins Hall, uh, room 126. Uh, this will be housed in the Department of Political Science and History uh, uh, under the leadership of, uh, uh, of Dean Damien Ejigiri, who is an enthusiastic supporter of this initiative. Uh, we've received some initial uh, uh, sup uh, funding support through the university through Title III. Uh, and, uh, to the tune of a close to around $80,000 to kind of help us with some technology upgrades to kind of get the program off, program off the ground. And uh, we have a preliminary pilot project to kind of get the program uh, 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 underway. Uh, the, uh, the young lady on the left is Dr. Melanie Johnson, who is here today. Uh, she will be uh, the principal investigator for, for a pilot project that, you know, you know, that, that we're looking at. Uh, uh, dealing with some attitudes of, about uh, of African Americans toward COVID-19. Uh, 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 the young lady in the cent center who is not here, Dr. Reva Hines, will be the secondary investigator. Uh, we're basically going to take advantage of some of the classes that we're already teaching as a basis for this project. Uh, and and, and fi finally, the, the young lady on the right, is Dr. Sharice Nelson. She is one of the newest faculty members in our department, and she has some background with standing up a, a research center from scratch. And so these are some of the individuals who will be working with this, who will be working with some staff that we already have on, on, on campus right now to, uh, to get, this, get, this, get this going. Uh, they are available in case uh, there are any specific questions anyone has. Finally, I'd like to mention that uh, uh, Advisory Board includes our dean, uh, uh, Dr. Ijigiri, uh, Professor Blanche Smith, uh, and myself. We served on, on, that, on the advisory council, advisory board for, for now. Um, that's the end of my, of my uh, presentation. But uh, at this time, if uh, uh, there's a, uh, a representative of the Preston's family, 
who would also like to make a comment. And then at that point, if anyone has any questions, then I'll be prepared to try to address those questions. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Hello. Just, just, a just one minute, uh, just a minute. Mr. Preston. Just a minute. Okay, go ahead. There you go. Hello, uh, my name is Grady Prestige, a 1980 graduate of Southern University. On behalf of the Prestige family, Terry Prestige White, a 1976 graduate, Eric Prestige, a 1982 graduate, Karen Prestige Washington, a 1985 graduate, Jay Prestige, a 1991 graduate, and our father, Dr. James Prestige, a 1950 graduate and former chancellor of Southern Baton Rouge. Countless offspring, aunts, uncles, and cousins, Southern University is our family alma mater. I'd like to thank Chairman Rutledge and the Southern University Board of Supervisors Dr. Belton, Dr. Samuels, Dr. Melanie Smith Johnson, who has been the family liaison for all the support uh, given in this acknowledgement of the Jewel Lamar Prestige Public Policy Polling and Research Center. My father and mother, my father instantly who turns 95 on April 29th, and my mother who left us in 2014 had an amazing partnership. Southern University was their life. Uh, they got a lot out of Southern University and put a lot into Southern University and very appreciative of this honor. We hope and pray that it meets the needs of the students of Southern University and that it serves the citizens of the state of Louisiana well. My mother will be proud and you can count on the Precious family for support and engagement with this center in the future. Thank you and go Jags. Thank you, thank you very much. Members, uh, any questions of Dr. Samuels? Any questions? Ms. Williams. Mr. Chair, I don't have a question, but I do have to say this is outstanding. And I would be honored to make this motion because Grady and I are very good friends. We served 13 years together. And he lives, well, you know, in Missouri City, but the love that he has and his family has for Southern University and speaking as a poli sci student, this is outstanding. And I know that we're going after a Carnegie designation so that we can hopefully start hosting things like the Harvard Institute right here at Southern University to train others that are either going to be working in the background or running for public office or being a part of public policy. So this is just an outstanding uh, venture that you all are going on and I would wholeheartedly love to make this motion. Ms. Uh, Ms. Williams, you should, you should know that the item has already been approved, but let the record reflect that the motion was made by Ms. Orlando thank Williams. Chair, and thank you, Grady. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Absolutely, Mr. Lawson. I, too, uh, echo my colleague uh, on uh, the sentiments of uh, Dr. Prestich, and it says a lot of your love for institution. You heard uh, the family, you know, if you love Southern, you know, you can kind of tell where you send your children. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they are proven uh, uh, supporters of our university. And I wanted to echo uh, the congratulations, too, from Central Louisiana, the prestigious uh, Dr. Tarver, uh, <laughs> hail from Central Louisiana. And we're very, very proud of them there, too. So, great to get to see you. And uh, we normally meet up at the same restaurant at Bayou Classic. Uh, hope to see you soon. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Mr. In, Chairman, may I also uh, chime yes, in? Yes, Mr. Gillum. Uh, Dr. Prestige was also my advisor and major professor. Uh, marvelous individual, always shot straight from the hip. And I'd like to say, uh, Dr. Grady, please to give my best regards to your dad, Jim. Personal friend of mine. Sure to tell him Sam said hello, won't you? Any, Dr. Davis. Yes, I, I just want to echo congratulations, best wishes. Any other comments? Any other comments? Thank you again, Dr. Samuels. Thank you all for presentation.
presentation. We'll go now to items J through M. Request authorization for the Southern University Law Center to negotiate an agreement with IOM Tuition and Mentor Works to provide alternate sources to finance student educational aspirations and pursuits. K, request approval of a memorandum of understanding to develop a remote slash virtual certificate and degree programs for students and professionals in Sub-Saharan Africa by the Southern University Law Center. Item L, request approval of tenure and promotion recommendation. And item M, request approval of tenure track recommendations for Catherine McFarland. Before we move on to item chancellors, any additional comments that you'd like to offer on items J, K, L, or M? Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Chairman Rutledge. Uh, just very briefly, um, the authorization to negotiate, we found that there's a new vehicle, relatively new vehicle, called income share agreements that can be used as a way to help finance students. We find that many students uh, come to us and they cannot qualify for the PLUS loan, which requires credit. They qualify for others, but not the PLUS loan. So we're viewing this as a way to help them get the additional funding without necessarily having the negative debt load problem uh, that is associated with the PLUS loan. Uh, so we want to delve into that greatly. And, we, and hopefully we will find that this could be a vehicle actually for the system itself if we are successful and share this information. The, the, the other item with the MOU, uh, Southern University Shre uh, Shreveport is leading the way uh, in providing certificate programs uh, for the system in many, many ways. And we're trying to catch up with them uh, in many ways by uh, offering certificate programs uh, that uh, will uh, inure to the benefit of professionals in Africa, but also in the U.S. So this is our attempt to uh, be uh, like our sister institution and offer some things that will be new and innovative from a law school perspective. And of course, uh, the request for a tenure track appointment for, doc for Professor McFarland uh, she's an excellent scholar, and uh, we appreciate uh, the board's uh, approval of these items for the Southern University Law Center. Thank you. Any questions, members? Any Con questions? Concern, Mr. Chair, for item number L. Uh -huh. Am I in order to ask for a point of clarification? Absolutely. Okay. I, I posed this concern, I believe, at our last meeting concerning the uh, promotion and tenure recommendations from the, from the uh, Baton Rouge campus. And of course, we all know that uh, promotion and tenure, these are the highest recognitions we can give to academia. And, but I'm noticing a trend, and I don't know, uh, maybe Dr. Uh, President or Dr. Saul can explain to me. Um, I fully understand how one level can approve or recommend, and another level, and any level can be um, superseded by the, um, what's that, I believe it's called the University Committee or the executive vice chancellor. My concern is this. There was a note, and the concern was at each one of the three levels from um, Baton Rouge campus, that there was a lack of peer review evaluation. That concerns me that indeed, this process uh, evolves perennially without an adequate evaluation at the peer level because um, as I understand it, this is actually the initial point in terms of deciding what's exemplary instruction. And usually the peers, of course, are the ones who decide whether this individual or individuals have uh, instituted proper research, proper publication, and for my interest, of course, instructional pedagogy. And of course, dare say, I'll throw another one in here. Dare say we even think about getting input from students because they are the end users of this process. And I'd like for, uh, if we can't address it now, I don't want to stall this down, Mr. Chair, but I believe we'll start meeting as a committee 
at the next meeting, maybe this, I think, falls within the purview of the academic committee. Correct. Could we possibly delve a little bit more in this, Mr. President, Mr. Dobson? Yes, sir. Okay. May I? Do you need a response, sir? I, I would appreciate one. It, it would be beneficial. Mr. Chairman? Certainly. Mr. President, um, thank you so much. Um, one of the things that we are doing is provide all information to the board. Now, to be honest, open, upfront, um, for a short period of time, we did not have uh, the peer review process. But the peer review score is there in the faculty handbook. So the um, tenure promotion committee went by the numerical score and gave a zero for the peer review portion. And since we did not have that data, we, ha we will have the data going forward. But these faculty members were not afforded the opportunity to have the peer review scores. So when a zero was put there, they fell short. Even though they have been exemplary faculty, they have done everything to own tenure, our promotion, the zero in the uh, peer review process hurt them. So we, when it came to us, we took that portion out and reconstituted, which we have presented there, and found if they are meeting requirements, and that's what we have presented. So what we have done is, uh, we have honored the peer review process, the sanctity of the peer review process. We have honored the faculty handbook, but at the same time, we have tried not to hurt the faculty members because of the absence of the score. But over time, we have inst reinstituted the peer review process so that the, re the, the faculty members coming forward will not have that problem. Oh, to follow up. As I appreciate it, shouldn't, shouldn't the uh, peers, especially within the various departments and or divisions, you know, I've always thought of it as being a responsibility to participate in that process, if not an outright obligation. Absolutely. You know, that's exactly what I think, you know, mentorship, um, guidance, and then accountability. And I think that's what we have recognized and we are, re you know, introducing or uh, starting that peer review process, uh, giving feedback. What we are doing also is to provide a one-year review, three-year review, and not wait for the six years to tell whether it is up or out. So we are getting, giving uh, feedback, and we are receiving feedback from the department chair, the faculty, um, so that our process of tenure and promotion is strengthened. Well, I'd like to go on record possibly as ask, I believe it's Ms. Smith who is chair of the academic committee. We might want to delve a little bit more into that, if you would, Mr. Chair. Certainly. To make sure that there is, is, is credibility to this whole process. And we'll be very happy to serve to provide all the information, the processes, so the, uh, the committee and the board will feel comfortable saying right. that you all are doing the right thing. And we want to feel comfortable. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any, uh, Dr. Davis. Yes, I, I want to echo. Dr. Davis, if you'll pull your mic just a yeah. little bit closer to you. Thank you. Thank you. I thought I could talk loud enough, but I guess I can't. Uh, thank you. Uh, but I, I want to uh, echo what's just been expressed by the board members. I have extreme concern as a person who came to Southern and Baton Rouge as an assistant professor and went all the way to be a dean and each time, the most important thing was peer review. And also, but one of the things that I did, and, and if there's some faculty members listening, I never applied for a promotion or tenure unless I first asked my chair and my dean if they were supported. And if they were not supported, then I decided that I'd leave and go to another university. In other words, uh, it ought to, we shouldn't see a faculty department level committee being overruled by a college level committee, being overruled by a university committee, and uh, uh, an administrator. Dean, uh, provost, or uh, other words. 
because this, this is most important, because this impacts the person's whole career. So you spend a number of years trying to get an academic degree. You end up at a university which requires you to spend a number of years. And I think that we need to really take this seriously. And if, if we don't have the right committees in place and people in place, Mr. President, Chancellor, I think we need to have a thorough review of the tenure and promotion program at Southern University, at, at Baton Rouge, and other places if need. But I think we really need to really look carefully at that and see what's going on and, and correct it. Thank you very much. Dr. Belton, based on the comments offered by Mr. <coughs> Gillum and Dr. Davis, would you be sure to, at uh, our next, at our May meeting, to have an agenda item for the Academic Affairs Committee that uh, allows for us to consider the process that's currently being employed uh, Certainly. going forward? Okay. Certainly, we'd be prepared to uh, offer some clarity and give evidence of our due diligence. <coughs> All right, any other questions or comments regarding these items? Is there a motion? Is there a motion? Is there a motion for items J, K, L, and M? I'll move, Mr. Chair. All right, it's been, it's been moved by Mr. Gillum, seconded by Mr. Shorty. Is there any objection? <coughs> Hearing none, those items stand approved. Okay, we're gonna try to dispense with items M, I'm sorry, N through through S. Request approval to implement a 100% one to implement 100% online degree courses effective fall of 2021. This is Southern University of New Orleans, a BS in criminal justice, a MA in criminal justice, a bachelor's in inter interdisciplinary studies, and a BS in health information management systems. O, oh, request approval to implement new programs of study specifically designed to address the workforce needs in the Northwest Louisiana region, increase enrollment, and provide more options and opportunities for embedded credentials. This is coming from Southern University at Shreveport. Specifically, it relates to Associates of Applied Science and Computer Engineering, Certificate of Technical Study, Certificate of Technical Study in Engineering, rather, Certificate of Technical Study in Quality Assurance, Energy Technology, Electronics Technology Technician, Petroleum Technology operated, Operator, Certificate of Applied Science in Digital Forensics, uh, Certificate of Technical Studies in Aviation, Automotive Technology, Precision Measurement Instruments, Payroll Accounting, Human Resource Specialist, Law Enforcement Administration, and Security Studies. Also an Associate in Applied Science degree in Graphic and Web Design. Another Certificate of Technical Studies in Graphics Design and Request to, uh, of Approval of a Certificate of General Studies. Uh, P, uh, Request Approval to Use Prior Year Funds for Student Services, SUBR. Request authorization to advance HBCU capital finance program application SUBR. Request approval of endowed professorship policy uh, Shreveport and request approval of a revised policy for endowed faculty chairs, faculty and chairs at SUBR. All right, we'll go back up to item uh, N. Any additional comments on N, Dr. Ammons? Or uh, M. Uh, no, the only thing that I would say, um, uh, Mr. Chair, is that uh, we have taken the directive from the board and the president very seriously. We came before to inform you that we were going to implement uh, new programs 100% online, and now we have expanded that number of programs, new programs that we will implement this coming fall. I was excited to see these items on the agenda, Dr. Ammons. Um, members, any questions about Ian? 
Any questions about N? All right, seeing now we'll go to O. Uh, anything additional to offer on O, Dr. Ellis? Not much, just wanted to say that uh, this is a concerted effort by us to strengthen our engineering and engineering related uh, programs and the majority of the certificate programs <coughs> are embedded, which means that they are already part of the associates of, of, of applied science or associates of science. They're just um, courses that are carved out of that associates to form a specific credential. All right. Question? Yes, sir. I uh, do believe in giving clarification, if you will, Dr. Ellis. Now, these programs, these certificate programs, have to be submitted to the Board of Regents DOR, right, for approval? Y yes. Uh, the associates uh, have to not only go to staff, but also to the board. The certificates uh, only have to go to the Board of Regents staff for approval. To staff. Okay, well, my concern, I went through them, and it appears as though some of the um, certificate programs that you have, because as I understand it, BOR will generally, if something is not totally complete, will kick it back. And it appears as though you've got some of these in here, and I'll call them out if you care, Mr. Chairman, will need, they're incomplete. In other words, BOR always asks for, what are, you, what, are gonna, what are your expenditures gonna be, what are your revenues gonna be? They want to know a projection of what your FTEs are going to be, full-time equivalencies, uh, what it's going to cost in the first three years. And you've got a few programs in here that don't fulfill those. And if, I think it would be expedient, Mr. Chair, Mr. President, to maybe have those programs resubmitted to us. Well, let me tell you ones that are complete, that I deem complete. And I can give you the pages in the packet if that, if that matters, Mr. Chancellor. Uh, the digital forensic program appears to have all of its information. It's in the packet on 122. Engineering certificate has all of its information on page 129. The automotive technical, whatever that is, uh, has its the airframe is good, the payroll account is good, the law enforcement is good, security studies is good, the associate, of course, of arts and graphics and the technical studies program on 175. Programs that are lacking, if you would, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, who, uh, would be the programs on page 93. There's no information there that I just referenced. Page 96, no information. 99, uh, 104, 107, 110, 113. And on page 121, and I'll close out, this is the last of it. You have a program there, there are no estimates there. That's your STEM program, I believe on page 121 in the packet. Am I the only one reading the board packet? <laughs> okay, here we go. But there are no estimates in terms of enrollment figures or graduate uh, projections for the years 2021 through 25. Why don't we give Dr. Ellis an opportunity to address? Yes, please. Sir. And yes, you, you mentioned page numbers, uh, Mr. Gillum, so I'm not exactly sure which. Uh, board packet. Uh, Programs. and the names of the program. But everything that's related to engineering, um, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, number 10, um, it's, they're, they're already embedded in an existing engineering program. And so Board of Regents having approved that original program does not require as much information on those certificates because they are already part of an existing program. It's just, all we're doing is take an existing program and carving out the courses and creating a credential so that students have an opportunity to participate in embedded or stackable credentials so that they could exit out uh, or get a specific skill set. Okay. So the uh, uh, blank pages that I'm looking at, they're intentional and not mistakes, uh, oversights. Uh, I mean, Doc, Mr. Gillum, I didn't write down those pages, unfortunately. So. <laughs> and I didn't mean to press you on it, but so. how about we how, how about we do this, Mr. Gillum, before yes. I go to Ms. Williams? You're not opposed to the creation of any of these uh, uh, no. programs, okay? No, sir. So how about whenever the motion is made that it is 
it's a given, however, just to make certain that we address your concern, that it's made with the caveat that prior to them being submitted either for approval by the Board of Regents staff or by the Board of Regents, that the, <clears throat> that the required information is complete. I can Does that satisfy that. your concern? I can with that, yes. Okay, thank you. Did that complete your questions, Mr. Gillum? That's it. Okay, we'll go now to Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one quick question um, for, Ms. for Dr. Ellis. I know that you're doing this to do the stackable credentials, but most of yours are also, didn't, didn't you receive or were eligible for this to become a part of the reboot program as well, right? Where the students can, where money can be reimbursed back, back to each one of these programs to continue it in the workforce area. So, to, uh, Mr. Gillum, to your question, I'm sorry, I thought I had a big enough mouth. <laughs> to your question, by setting this and, and allowing the students an opt out, it's also allowing the programs to grow financially and stronger because the state of Louisiana through the Department of Education granted an opportunity on the workforce side. And so most schools have been um, combining their workforce and academics to get these stackable credentials, which lend to um, wage earning jobs as well as industry-based credentials and a reimbursement back to the school's programs. Is that what your aim is in this, Dr. Ellis? Yes, so SUSLA, I think we, our allocation is about 500,000. Yeah. And so in essence, um, through this reboot program, and also we've received a couple of grants uh, 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 to, uh, from the Department of uh, Education that are s related to reboot. So basically any student going through these programs, these short-term credential programs that can be high wage, uh, high demand employment, basically get free tuition and uh, fees taken care of. And then also by adding, which is very um, innovative of your team, by adding the, or changing them into certificates of technical study, they can get the short term training and then cross over into the academic side to go either the certificate way or the associate's degree way, correct? Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Madam Vice Chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> any, other, <laughs> any other any other questions? Any other questions, concerns? All right, we'll go now to uh, item P and Q. Dr. Belton, do you wish to add anything to those items? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would just want to uh, <coughs> uh, give indication uh, to the board of our intent, particularly related to Q. Uh, Q uh, seeks your authorization to advance a uh, application to the Department of uh, uh, Education to participate in the HBCU capital uh, finance program. Uh, our aim uh, is to construct uh, honors uh, accommodations for our students, uh, as many as uh, 250 to 300 beds. Uh, for uh, honor storm and to finally give consideration to constructing a new student union. Uh, we uh, feel very optimistic uh, that uh, we have the resources to do so and if we are successful, uh, this would be the first step in a process to which we hope will end as early as uh, September 30th uh, of, of this year. So. Uh, uh, certainly, we will offer more context uh, for you as we uh, move forth, but this clearly will be uh, an exciting opportunity to, again, transform for students uh, the landscape of Southern University of Baton Rouge. Thank you. Uh, and while you have the floor, Dr. Belton, is there anything you wish to add to S? I know that's an... Uh, an item that we had on previously and pulled off to for some further refinement to the language. Is that any other, anything you wish to add to that? No, well, uh, as you pointed out, uh, we were very adamant about ensuring that uh, we received inputs uh, from the faculty and the faculty senate who helped, uh, who worked with the administration to develop a sound policy as related to uh, endowments, and, and we are pleased to inform you that that has occurred. And as I appreciate it, item R dovetails S. It does. Okay. All right. Any questions, members? Yes. Any? Yes, Dr. Davis. Yes, on, on S, uh, does S impact uh, those faculty members who are currently serving as endowed professors? 
Yes, sir. They will they will have to resubmit or make changes based on uh, this new programming. I'm sorry. Yes. This new programming. So I, th I think what this policy ultimately does is provide us with more flexibility to um, to provide for faculty the the indirect compensation that would be uh, that would support uh, the in the endowment. I think we previously had a fixed stipend. Uh, and uh, this in actually increases or provides the university the flexibility to increase uh, that stipend uh, as uh, uh, stipulated by uh, donors. And so that would apply to either a, a an endowed professor and or an endowed chair going forward. So, so the university can augment the, the amount of funds for the stipend as well as the money for travel or auxiliary use. That is my understanding. Is it? Okay. Okay. Is that? All that right. is correct. I, I was just want to be sure that those who've already earned these positions that they'll be able to retain them. Oh, they, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think, um, yeah, they will not only uh, retain what they have, but the university uh, have the flexibility to increase that going forward. Mr. Garvey. Yes, thank you, Chairman, for giving me the floor. Um, as you know, I am a student board member, and my whole purpose of being on the board is to advocate for the students. And I noticed, and this is just a statement, and I noticed that, you know, we are, we're, we're giving money to faculty members, and that's fine, you know. Um, they're, and rightfully do so, entitled to money. Um, but those, as we increase money, we do increase responsibilities on them as well. Um, and also know that you mentioned in regards to revamping the tenure, tenure policy and on, under the review of the academic policy. My concerns is that, um, and I've been talking to several students throughout all campuses, is that um, the pedagogy of learning in, in terms of faculty development. Um, we, when we get to higher learning, um, we tend to allow the terminal degree to be the status point or the status quo for you to become a professor or to get into a professor track. And, and that's fine, and, uh, but, but what's heartening for me because I come with a teaching background is that we here at Southern University have an education program that we teach pedagogies of learning, but we do not disseminate that to our faculty. And that goes throughout the board, throughout the campuses. We are to have faculty development because I have a PhD or Juris doctorate or any terminal degree doesn't qualify me or solidify me to be able to disseminate that knowledge to students. And we have a specifically uh, very tailored population that we're trying to reach. And it'd be remiss now to look at it in terms of looking at the pedagogy of learning because just because I, again, just because I have a terminal degree does not give me the opportunity to know how to disseminate that knowledge to the students. And it is a failure to the students if we do not start having personal development. And again, I know I only have one more month on the board, but I have to say that because I'd be remiss not to because again, and excuse my allergies, again, I have nothing but advocacy to all the students that work on this system. And so, you know, every board meeting we get in here and we approve, and it's great. I don't have a problem, and I've said it before, I don't have a problem paying faculty for their money, but again, we start to have to have some type of responsibility for the students because I, I know students are not feeling like they have the greatest professors here, and that comes in with with, with development. And so we ha we can have that in, in the K through 12. Why can we have that at a higher institution? It's something that we need to think about and, and, and start moving forward when we move forward. And the last thing that I would like to say is that um, speaking on some of the the uh, certificates and, and associate degrees that have been approved. Um, I'm also working with the student body of uh, the student leadership in terms of produ to in, in terms of introducing some curriculums that the student body would like to hear. And I'd like for you guys to be receptive next month when I, when I am the and chairman. If you allow me to have the floor to give a presentation next month on those matters. Thank you. 
Certainly. Well, Thank Mr. you, Mr. Garvey. Let me just say, you know, your point uh, with regard to professional de development of, of faculty, that certainly resonates uh, uh, throughout the Southern University system. I think most of us have a activity supported by, supported through Title III to provide uh, resources for faculty to uh, access uh, training and, uh, and to uh, uh, benefit from uh, opportunities to travel to conferences and things of that nature. Clearly, that travel has been limited this past year, uh, but we do provide resources for faculty to engage in continuing development. You should know, and, and again, uh, we will publicize this, but uh, one of the things that we aspire to do uh, on the Baton Rouge campus uh, and utilizing the resources from the uh, American Rescue Act is to really develop a center for teaching and learning that would uh, enable you know, faculty and staff uh, a place to which they could uh, 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 obtain a mastery of, of different things to include uh, facilitating instruction online and, and things of that nature. So uh, certainly we are putting resources <coughs> behind what you see as an imperative and, and one that we actually agree with. Thank you, President Belkin. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shorty. One thing that I would ask is, is someone who primarily reads laws for a living, um, I, I think it's, it's, it's fairly difficult um, to find what we're revising sometimes. Um, I'm looking at the policy in the packet, it's eight or nine pages, and normally in the practice of law, if somebody's revising something, they spell it out and they say, look, this is what we've got currently, and we'll outline and say, this is what we're doing and this is what we're changing. And I've really got to read into this to try and determine what you're doing where it could have been resolved in, in, a, in a blurb that says, hey, the current policy does this and the, the revised policy does this. And then I know it, but I'm, I find myself searching to find the revision and just to, it'd be helpful if we can kind of flush that out a little bit, uh, make it simple for people like me, put it in red and bold it. I joined Mr. Shorty in his request. In fact, I think I made a request previously that whenever we're going to make some policy changes that the changes be redlined so that we can see what, what the difference is. This is a lot, as, you can, as you can see, you know, all of us are busy, but this is a lot of information to process and absorb in anticipation of a meeting along with everything else you've got going on. So I, I joined Mr. Shorty in, the, in that request. Any other questions or comments regarding these items? Hearing none, uh, Mr. Lawson moves uh, approval of items in through S. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by Ms. Williams. Is there any objection? Hearing none, the items stand <coughs> approved. We're going now to item T, request approval of salary adjustments for instructors slash academic counselors at the Southern University Law Center, Chancellor Pierre. Yes, again, good, good morning. Uh, so, as I've said in previous board meetings, we have had a uh, monumental increase in uh, our, our enrollment. But more importantly, um, what we see, which is critical to our success, is the need to constantly grow, revise, our academic support and instructional roles. And with respect to the fact that we are now having both a civil law track and a common law track, one of the biggest things we had to do on, at the front end, which we're doing right now, is we have to talk to the students who have been admitted in the law school and help them make a decision whether or not they're gonna go through the civil law track versus the common law track. And Mr. Garvey can attest to the fact of what we're doing in terms of supporting students that are taking common law bars. We have had to ramp up that operation uh, with significant investments so that those students can be successful. And we are seeing the success outside of the state of Louisiana. We are seeing great success within the state of Louisiana, but even more so now, we have to see that success outside of the state of Louisiana because the ABA is really grading us on our national bar passage and those results will be published very soon and we'll probably have a report for you next, next, next month to let you know how we're doing 
uh, especially in an environment where we're still trying to be a school of access and opportunity, and this becomes a great investment. And the, you know, the boards uh, allowing us to make that investment is very much appreciated. All right, any questions? Mr. Garvin? Yeah, well, you know, that I, I, hello? Did y'all turn off my mic? <laughs> no, sir. No, I would like to, I would like I don't to have any that. control over the mic. <laughs> I, I would like to add on, Chancellor has done a wonderful job my four years of being there at the Law Center. I, I, I always tell him he would wait till I'm out the door to start getting some of these great things and, and innovation mindsets that he's doing. Um, we have grown tremendously since I've been there from when I came in in 2017 and it being the largest class of 180 to last class being what chance for 300 over 361 students for one else and so we've grown tremendously with that we've grant, garnered students from all over the country and not even just the country the world we have international students as well and so um, it is imperative that we start to make our imprint not only in civil but in the common law tracks, because a lot of this, as you know, most students would like to return back to their, their respective jurisdictions and practice. And so the money that he has been trying to do and the, the, the things that he's been doing is, is tremendous. Um, I've had the opportunity to take some of the pilot programs again, because I've been there so long. And um, it is wonderful. And um, again, I'm waiting for the efforts and seeing what our, our bar results will start looking like in the next week or so, right, Chancellor? Yeah. All right, thank you. Very good. Dr. Davis? Yes, uh, Chancellor Pierre. Uh, I noticed that for item T that all of the funding comes from federal. Uh, is, is that a special grant, or do you have a direct line of funding going to the committees in uh, Yeah, so this, this is the Title III HBGI. Uh, so when we look at Title III, funding for historically black colleges. The Southern University system is blessed to have Title III funding for Baton Rouge, Shreveport, and New Orleans, and the Law Center, which is the, the graduate and professional uh, portion, which we share with the Baton Rouge campus for graduate programs. So we are funding all of these instructional academic support programs and all of our clinics, well not all of them, most of our clinics through these Title III as well as the um, technology infrastructure uh, that we have greatly enhanced over the number of years. So Title III is the, is the funding source and we've been very fortunate uh, in the last really three or four years to see those dollars increase each and every year. Thank you. Uh, I just want to be sure that, that you're looking long term at this as far as if you're bringing on faculty and they're in tenure track positions that, that they keep. Well, well, that, so let me, let me, so this is not tenure track. That's this not is, tenure track. This is, no, when, when it comes to tenure track, we're doing that all out of our self generated dollars. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I, I made this explanation the other day, so this is really fresh to me. When you look at the appropriations we expect to get, which is about roughly four million to four and a half million dollars from the state legislature, give or take a few dollars. The other 13, 14 million, in other words, we're operating at about 18 million dollars. That's self-generated dollars, it, which includes Title III, but in other words, that's non-state funding. So what we use this for is for these special categories for clinical faculty, for these instructional support, for academic counselors, because what they do for us is they give us the ability to give our students real world experiences and academic support that you just don't find at most other law schools. There are a few law schools that can do it. Someone commented that we might have the largest academic support program in the country and I said, I haven't checked, but that may be true. That, that may be true. And here's, the, here's a very significant point. Chancellor, mm -hmm. thank you. I'm, I'm not going to redirect, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm done. Okay. I'm, I'm yeah. All right. Okay. Any additional questions regarding this item? All right. Hearing none, Mr. Garvey, do you move favorable? 
I've definitely moved favorable. All right, is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by Mr. Shorty. Is there any objection to item T's approval? Hearing none, the item stands approved. We go now uh, to item U, Dr. Belton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board. Uh, I seek your endorsement uh, to uh, approve uh, equity adjustments for uh, five uh, deans that assume roles of leadership uh, on the SUBR campus. Uh, uh, you should know that uh, over the last uh, uh, 45, over the last month and a half, uh, I uh, have taken on, um, uh, I've taken on a position of trying to begin to review um, salary ranges amongst uh, senior administrators uh, and we are embarking upon uh, such a review for uh, faculty and staff. Uh, and as I initiated uh, that review, uh, what became very apparent to me uh, as relates to the deans was what I perceived to be uh, glaring instances of uh, inequities, particularly as related to gender, and such that when it came to my attention, I felt compelled uh, to address that immediately. And what you have before you then uh, is my effort to try to uh, uh, bring some uh, remedy uh, to those uh, inequities that, that I had witnessed. I, I should share with you that um, that uh, these recommendations are not based on merit. They, does, they do not speak to tenure, nor the productivity uh, of these deans, uh, but simply one uh, that uh, uh, provide uh, for some equity as relates to the salaries that are enjoyed by men uh, as opposed to uh, women. I therefore, ask your consideration, Mr. Chair. Move for approval, Mr. Chair. Second. All right, it's been, it, it's been, it's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or concerns regarding item U from board members? Is there any objection? Hearing none, those items stand approved. All right, we'll go now to item uh, V. And what I'll do here, members, because this cuts across uh, almost every uh, entity within the uh, system is I will ask is there any are there any questions or concerns regarding any items in section V in item V between one and nine any questions is there a motion yes Ms. Ms. Williams um, and I'll make the motion to move and then for discussion but I just have a question there's a couple that's just listed as additional duties and I just want to make certain that the amount that we're increasing the salaries to is equivalent to the amount of the duties that they're going that's going to be added to them. So I guess that would be a question for Dr. Belton. And Chancellor Pierre. Yes, sir. <coughs> Chancellor Pierre, would you go first? Yes. Uh, so it, with respect to uh, Miss Hunter, I believe is the one that relates to additional duties, if I'm not mistaken. So actually, this is. Uh, you may recall a month ago, you uh, as a board uh, supported our ability to do what we call the lab set initiative, which brings in all of the disciplines into a, a consortium where we provide all students with these additional skills that are technology skills that are industry-based certifications. So we have been able to secure funding from the Louisiana Department of LED. And with that, we submitted a budget because we need to promote this through the system and it's gonna require heavy marketing and communication plan. And therefore, that those are the additional duties that Ms. Hunter is gonna take on with respect to those activities uh, related to LabSet uh, with the approval of LED. Dr. Belton? Yes, forgive me, I'm losing my voice. Uh, I think the only action item I have is uh, with regard to action item five. And in this case, uh, 
<coughs> and in this case, uh, 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 I'm asking your consideration uh, to acknowledge the additional duties that I have. I ask uh, Dr. Merritt uh, to, cons to uh, assume, uh, as you know, uh, Dr. Merritt serves as the vice president and initially has been bringing oversight and leadership over those efforts across the system. I have uh, further asked her to begin to assume additional responsibilities, specific responsibilities, as it relates to uh, Southern University of Baton Rouge, uh, particularly uh, in, in light of uh, our aim to integrate ourselves even more so in the community uh, and to coordinate the efforts with the system and the uh, communication infrastructure on the Baton Rouge campus. And so uh, those were the uh, assignments that I asked her to consume as uh, additional responsibilities and therefore my recommendation. Ms. Moses, can you also put uh, Ms. Moses as additional responsibility? Who? Number six. Yes, um, uh, yes, in, in light of, uh, 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 actually, we really kind of defined uh, Mrs. Moses', Moses uh, responsibilities, uh, particularly with regard to uh, her work in uh, advancing uh, continuing education uh, and uh, what, what is the inter international programs as well. And so we had, uh, uh, Dr. Sahu, I think yes. we changed the title and and, we uh, did. and was more prescriptive about the responsibilities that she would uh, add, uh, and, and that's what brought about this, this recommendation. We have expanded uh, the offering of certificates through our continuing, continuing education office, and that is bringing in you know, attention, both uh, positive attention to the university and our source of revenue. Thank you. Any other any other questions or comments? Seeing none, it's been moved. Up. Remind me who moved, Doctor. You did, Miss Williams, and seconded by Mr. Gillum. Is there any objection to the approval of item B? Hearing none, it stands approved. Item W, uh, request approval of sabbatical for fall 2021 for Doctor David Adaboye. Is there a motion? So moved. It's been moved by Miss Williams, seconded by Mr. Shorter. Any objection? Hearing none, that item stands approved. We'll now go to Dr. Williams for our resolutions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. The March 2021 resolutions are as follows. Our sincerest condolences to Ms. Angela Hopkins, her family. Uh, Ms. Angela Hopkins was a resident of Shreveport, Louisiana. She was the Thank you. Our sincerest condolences to the Angela Hopkins family. Ms. Angela Hopkins was a resident of Shreveport, Louisiana. She was the youngest sibling of former board chairman, Dr. Leon Tarver and Senator Greg Tarver. She passed away on March 23rd, 2021. There was a private family service on April 1st, 2021. Dr. Tarver, we keep your family in our thoughts and our prayers, sir. Our condolences also to the Mr. Staple Haynes family. Mr. Haynes was a native of St. Joseph, Louisiana and a resident of Seattle, Washington. He received his BS degree in mathematics from Southern University in 1962. He was a founding member of the Puget Sound chapter of the Southern University Alumni Association. He has served as the association's treasurer for 40 years. He was the brother-in-law of Mr. Henry Baptiste. He passed away on April 6th, 2021. Our condolences also to the Alex Brown family. Mr. Alex Brown uh, was a native of New Orleans and residents of Baton Rouge. He received his BS degree in secondary education in 1967 and a certification in special ed in 1987 from Southern University. 
He was a member of the local East Baton Rouge Parish Chapter and National Chapter of Southern University Alumni F Federation and co-recipient along with his wife of the 2010 Alumnus of the Year Award. He passed away on April 7, 2021. Our condolences also to the Leroy Evans III family. Mr. Leroy Evans was a native of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He was the son of Ms. Mary Evans, who is the procurement manager in the Office of Purchasing on the Baton Rouge campus. He passed away on March 7, 2021. Of course, our condolences, as Chancellor Pierre stated earlier, to Southern University Law Center student, Mr. William Neighbors. And Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn it over to Board Member Whitfield, who has a special acknowledgement. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the board for recognizing Leroy Evans. Leroy was my cousin, and um, I was at the funeral, so we really appreciate that. And I presented uh, the commendation at the, at the funeral, so thank you all for doing that. Uh, also, I think it would be remiss, I'm sure you all saw it if you didn't, there was a young lady from LSU who went missing, Corey Goshen, that they found her body several weeks after she went missing. The vigil outpouring from the Southern University students was very uh, impressive, and so I just thought it would, it would be nice that we would, would recognize her all and give condolences to her family. Uh, that was uh, quite an enduring thing to go through. The community was very supportive in trying to find the young lady, and when they found her dead, uh, of course, it was not what we hoped for, but the Southern University family did support uh, them through that, so thank you so much for allowing me to recognize her. Mr. Chair, that concludes, Mr. Vice Chair, that concludes our resolutions for this month. Thank you so much. We're gonna move now to uh, informational items and begging everyone's indulgence. Oh. Can I get a motion to approve the resolution? I, I move it. So move, move, second. Any opposed? Yes. Thank you. Any opposed? That action item is approved. Um, we're going to take up the legislative update. Dr. Merrick is ready with our legislative update. Yes, sir, Mr. Vice Chairman. I think we were going to do the statewide vaccination campaign update first and then go into the legislative update, if that's okay. That's fine only because it's up on the screen. <laughs> Good morning again, um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. President, and members of the board. Uh, we want to update you regarding the statewide public awareness campaign that the university launched on last month. You may have heard uh, information about this on the 27th of March was our official launch date with a press conference that we held in the Board of Supervisors meeting room on the Baton Rouge campus. Uh, our main event that took place not long after that was the statewide vaccination day that we had held across the state of Louisiana on April 10th. Uh, one of our sites was on the 9th, and we have uh, just a quick slideshow that we wanted to share, and uh, this initiative is something that our chairman brought to, to our attention. He brought it to the president, who then brought it to uh, our team uh, at the university to put this campaign together and reach out across the state with a number of our partners, uh, including the... Southern University System Foundation. So this was a, a photo from the press conference. Uh, we have over 100 partners of, from our alumni chapters, faith-based organizations, civil rights organizations, uh, fraternities and sororities have all gathered to work with us on this across the state and appeared with us at the press conference, some in person and some virtually on that day to share this information broadly. As I said, on the 10th, we were covered across the state in nine locations. Uh, this, these locations overlap the state's regional health, um, regional health, regional health areas. Um, we did have one site on the 9th, which was in Covington. Uh, we partnered with the St. Tammany Parish uh, effort that was going on that day at the fairgrounds, but these are the sites that we were located in, and we relied heavily upon our students, our alums, uh, faith-based or faith organizations, as well as the fraternities and sororities in each of these areas. This photograph is actually from the Covington site at the uh, St. Tammany Fairgrounds. As I said, we had a number of partners working on this with us and to include our students. Uh, we took this as an opportunity on our campuses, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, and Shreveport. Uh, these sites were held specifically on those campuses. Uh, we had our students, like I said, involved in sharing information about the university on that day as well. 
again, more of our volunteers um, throughout this effort. It was a really rainy day, um, but we were there that morning to kick everything off from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. And we partnered with the uh, Louisiana Department of Health on this, as well as the National Guard to really facilitate the logistics of what took place. So our total number came in at about 1,011 persons served over the course of the day, over the course of the two days, rather. Uh, we were excited about this number. We wanted it to be a little higher, uh, but that we reached that number. We were good about that. And our total effort since February uh, with our community outreach as it relates to vaccine participation is 2,028 vaccines. Um, many of those taking place on the Baton Rouge campus at the F.G. Clark Activity Center. And this photograph that you're looking at right now was a line of cars that were there as early as 8.30 that morning waiting to have their vaccinations. Lots of media coverage uh, on this effort. Uh, the university taking charge. We've even seen a little national attention as an HBCU that's leading this effort to encourage our communities of color uh, in getting their vaccinations. And uh, we've got an educational campaign that's gonna continue over this weekend. So that's tomorrow, Bayou Classic. We'll have a tent working with NOCCI, our Bayou Classic management company. Grambling State has joined on board with this effort. The Department of Health, as well as LSU's Health Science Center is a part of this. We uh, were doing, we were planning to do vaccines on site tomorrow, but that got preempted, of course, because of the J&J &J challenges that we're having nationwide and even worldwide. So we've put a pause on that along with everyone else. The masks that you received today will be shared with all of the guests that will be coming to the stadium tomorrow. We've purchased a number of those uh, for that effort. So fans coming to the stadium will receive this mask. Uh, we do see it as a collector's item. Our campaign theme is don't wait, vaccinate. Uh, as you see right here, don't sit on the sidelines, get vaccinated. So we've got a number of items that will be going forth tomorrow. Uh, the Department of Health will be here with fans as well. Some other promotional items to encourage vaccine participation across our state. Be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I do want to thank our Department of Communications on the Baton Rouge campus uh, for designing this mask, working with our team to select which, uh, which version of the mask was most appropriate to include all of our campus colors. Mr. Chairman, did you? Well, I just want to thank uh, you, Dr. Merrick, uh, the uh, Bayard Group, um, and I'm gonna get in trouble, and I said I wasn't gonna call any names, but you know who you are. Uh, it was a really good day for Southern on th this past Saturday. I got more texts, I got more uh, folks telling me that they were going to get vaccinated and they were very happy that we were doing this. Uh, Dr. Belton and I, uh, Mr. Hammond, Dr. Renee, uh, got in, left early Saturday morning and drove to our site in Lafayette. Uh, where there was tremendous engagement. Members of the local legislative delegation were there. We came to Baton Rouge, uh, where Dr. Merrick and members of her staff and folks from the Baton Rouge campus were working. Uh, we drove down to New Orleans, Dr. Ammons, uh, board member Shorty met us there. And then we went down to Homa, uh, where uh, Ms. Williams was. And working hard, uh, had a, a, a site set up at her church and the National Guard was at every location. We had uh, students, we had other volunteers, and it just was a well-oiled machine. And one of the things uh, that the governor said to Dr. Belton and I, we, had, we were talking prior to his uh, State of the State address, which was given from Southern, which was another historic event, uh, he really thanked us for taking the lead and responding to his appeal to give some leadership to this. So thank you. Thank you to everybody. Uh, Dr. Belton was so impressed with this until he says, man, we need to do some more. So uh, one of the things that we would like to do, we've got board members all over the state. And so those of you that who are interested in doing it, we would like for you to be uh, surrogates and give leadership uh, to perhaps an appeal on the radio in your local community and billboards and that kind of thing. So uh, Dr. Merrick will be reaching out to you such that we can uh, coordinate that going forward over the next couple of days. So, but thank you and thank you, Dr. Belton, and to everybody uh, who who participated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and those if I didn't call your name, I apologize. I'm sorry. Because I, I, I do think that uh, uh, Chancellor Ellis and his team up here, they had a, a, a great number of people who kind of came out 
for, for that event. And so it was, uh, I, I think you were joined by the president of the National Alumni uh, Federation. So the whole day, Mr. Chair, as you pointed out, was just, I think, uh, it was a reflection of the values of Southern University and the NM College system. And, uh, and certainly we have an obligation to continue to push this out. And so, uh, again, I, I just want to affirm uh, your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. President. Also, those billboards, oh, I did that, sorry about that. Uh, those billboards are going forward on, on this weekend. So there'll be a number of them, you'll see them across the state. Uh, I think they were launching on Thursday or Friday, that maybe yesterday or today, so uh, be on the lookout for the billboards. Uh, some of your images will be on those, on those billboards. Um, moving on to the legislative update, uh, Dr. Renee is sharing with you all copies of the university's legislative priorities for 2021, and also a copy of our bill tracking, the bills that we'll be watching for this session. I do want you to know that this week marks the, today rather, marks the end of the first week of the 2021 regular session of the Louisiana Legislature. Uh, as you're aware, Governor Ed Edwards held his annual State of the State address at the university. As you heard the chairman say, this was a, a historic moment for us because this was the first time this State of the State address was taken away from the state capitol. And of course, we were looking to um, be very COVID compliant in that regard, and he uh, chose Southern University and of course our stadium the A.W. Mumford Stadium to hold this, this event. On last week, um, Dr. Belton and fellow system heads testified before the Senate Finance Committee, and on the week before, he testified before the House of Pro I'm sorry, I said it the other way around. The week before, he testified for Senate Finance, and this past week, he testified before the House Appropriations Committee regarding the university's upcoming 2020 and 2021 budget, COVID-19 implications on higher education and CARES Act funding, as well as issues surrounding uh, Title IX in higher ed. So um, the outlook this year is looking better for the state as it relates to funding. So I think we're in a good place for some of our priorities to be met. Do want to call to your attention a few dates that are important to us that are coming up. This Tuesday <coughs> is SU Day at the Capitol. It's gonna be a virtual event, so it is not gonna be an in-person event, but we will send you the link to join us on that effort. On the 26th of April, that will be HBCU Day at the Capitol. That too will be a virtual event um, sponsored by the Board of Regents and the HBCU Advisory Council, and we will share that link with you as well. And on the 28th, we're planning to have a legislative reception on the campus at the Wade House, similar to the event that was held following the governor's uh, State of the State address, and you all, of course, will receive invitations for that event. Um, as I said, the priorities are being disseminated. Our, our top priorities this year are continued funding stabilization for the university's appropriations, our faculty salary increases, equitable funding for the university's land grant function continues to be a concern of ours, capital outlay, as you well know, um, we're on the road to getting our new science building, science complex rather, for the Baton Rouge campus, also looking to have a new college of business very soon as well as our number one new priority for this year. Uh, support for our deferred maintenance across higher ed, assistance with our funding for our mandated costs that we don't get funding for, and an increase in GO grants. Just so you know, the bill tracking that you're looking at right now, that information will be shared with you electronically. If you're interested in any of those bills, they'll be hyperlinked such that you can click on the bill number and you'll be able to see exactly what the bill does. Uh, there were about 974 bills that were filed so far this session. This is a fiscal only session, but legislators are able to um, um, file about up to five additional bills on subjects other than fiscal matters. We are tracking about 94 of those bills that have some implication to higher education in some way, shape, or form. And we're also tracking mar marijuana bills and hemp bills this year. Uh, the hemp industry is becoming uh, a concern of ours in a good way. And of course, we're watching anything that implicates or uh, has impact on our marijuana production with our Ag Center. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my update for the legislative session so far. I'll be happy to entertain any questions if there are any. Members? Thank you, Dr. Merritt. Thank you, sir. All right. <clears throat> Members, we'll continue on with our informational items 9A, our interim financial update, Mr. McClinton. Morning. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. It's time. It's Almost afternoon. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> the other members of the board, and Mr. President. 
<laughs> my members aren't used to this <laughs> being at this hour. Proceed. Okay, you have in the packet uh, the up, <laughs> an update on the uh, financial statements, and we provide this information each month. And what we are doing monthly is monitoring the expenditures to make certain that they are in line with the uh, revenue projection. And as of this point, for each campus, the uh, spending is in line with the uh, revenue projection. And I will entertain any questions that you may have at this time. Any questions, members? The documentation is contained in your backup information. Thank you, Mr. McKinley. Members, I'm going to beg your indulgence. This next item was requested by Mr. Gillum, I believe, and it's a dual enrollment update by campus. Uh, so I'm certainly going to ask uh, chancellors, whomever you've designated, to present the information to do so in as efficient a manner as possible. And we will begin with uh, we'll begin with Dr. Ammons. Oh, oh, sorry, Susley's already up there. So we'll begin with you, Dr. Ellis. Thank you. I'm going to have uh, Dr. Melba Williams, uh, Dr. Terry Kidd, and their teams to come present. Good morning, everyone, again, and I will uh, go as quickly as possible. We have uh, had dual enrollment on our campus. Um, I think uh, Dr. Belton may remember this. I think Southern University of Shreveport was the first campus in the state of Louisiana to have a dual enrollment program. Um, and so we're very proud to um, have that program and be able to uh, serve the students of uh, Cattle Parish and beyond. And, and we're excited about that, and you'll hear uh, the beyond, a little bit more about the beyond part in just a few. Uh, we have, we want to jump right into some of the exciting things that we have. We'll have some graduates uh, that will actually graduate with certificates and degrees uh, with our graduating class on May 22nd that are in high school. They are in high school. They're students at Booker T. Washington High School. Um, they're part of an early college initiative and they will earn the Associate of Science in General Studies, and one will earn the Certificate of Early Childhood Education from Booker T. Washington at Woodlawn. We have four candidates that will earn a Certificate in Early Childhood at uh, Woodlawn. Uh, at Lincoln Prep uh, Academy, and we have the principal here today, he's gonna talk a little bit about some of the innovative things that he is doing. We have 11 students, 11 students that will earn the Associate of Science degree in general studies, and they are high school students. So we're very, very, very proud of our uh, Jaguars who are in high school. Uh, our academic affairs and dual enrollment program, we provide a series of partnerships. I'm very proud to have an opportunity to work alongside a fantastic uh, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Dr. Terry Kidd. He's going to come in just a minute. And uh, we work together to, provi to provide partnerships, adjunct uh, faculty and technology trainings to support quality and accountability practices uh, through Banner, Moodle, and just really providing the educational opportunities for students. Uh, our priorities, we have uh, constantly had meetings with the leadership at those schools, but even more so, I'm really proud of the work that Dr. Ellis is doing. Uh, most recently, he has gone yet again to meet with all of the principals, and I think he has a slate uh, more that he'll be meeting with to just hear feedback on how we can improve and how we can continue to do more with dual enrollment. So we are thrilled uh, that he is getting out and um, meeting those folks yet again and just re-engaging them, along with board members. So we're very proud of our relationship with our board members and uh, on the Cattle Parish School Board and on this very board that have worked uh, so very hard with us, uh, Mr. Richard Hilliard, uh, Mr. Sam Gilliam, and Ms. Dottie Bell. I think she is left the building, but we're very excited about um, having an opportunity to work with them. Uh, we have a new partnership coming up with Webster Parish 
uh, out in uh, Webster Parish, they will be earning their CNA. Students from their institution, their school will be earning their CNA this summer. And uh, they're in Menden, Louisiana, and our nursing department is going to be uh, having that program for them this summer. And then, of course, DeSoto Parish Schools, we're out uh, there with our fast forward uh, agreement, and we're going to offer Jumpstart and TOPS um, Associate of Computer Science and Industrial Engineering to dual enrollment students so that those students can graduate while they are in high school. So we're excited about that. We have a lot of retention strategies. Let's talk numbers. Uh, our program continues to etch its way up. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that we were able, even in a COVID environment, to increase our enrollment in fall 2020. Uh, spring 2021, we were able to uptick just a little bit, and we have more uh, coming our way. Uh, we have a dual enrollment handbook, which is very important to our students and the counselors and principals in which we serve. That's on our webpage. We walk um, our colleagues and partners through the a handbook so they can better understand how they um, can connect and do the things that they do to be responsible for uh, the program. And we're starting to market our program even more. And so we have ordered some yard signs so that people can be proud of what we're doing and we can get the Southern University name uh, out there in our community. So these yard signs have been ordered. They are on the way. Every dual enrollment student uh, we have about 600 and probably even more that will be coming on board in the fall. They will be able to get this yard sign, put it in their front yard, and be really proud of Southern University and their engagement. Um, most recently, my team that's here, Dr. Tuesday Mahoney, Dr. Calvin Lester, Ms. Monica McEachin, if they would wave, they're the ones that really do a lot of the work every single day. So I want to thank them uh, for their dedication to this program. They brought sweet treats, just a visit to those campuses, uh, blue and gold covered strawberries, and to demonstrate how sweet it is to partner with Southern University. So uh, we were very excited about that. And uh, we've had different engagement opportunities, getting them excited about the game uh, that's coming up on tomorrow. And we had a dual enrollment workshop uh, just this week where we gave them information about going to college and how they can uh, continue to learn. I'm going to ask for my colleague, uh, Dr. Terry Kidd, to hop up here. He has a couple of things he wants to say, and then we'll um, communicate with uh, our principal in one second. Greetings and salutations, everyone. Um, part of the work that we're doing in dual enrollment is to do a systematic review of how we offer our services and outcomes. And so I want to bring our attention to the ways in which we framed how we want to operate our dual enrollment. And so the Aligning for Student Success, how community colleges work with our P16 partners provides us guidance. This is an exhaustive review of dual enrollment programs across the country that was conducted by AACC, which is our Association for Community Colleges in America. And in this exhaustive report, they've issued recommendations and strategies. And so we have to begin with the end in mind, which is the success and completion of our students, which is walking across the stage. And so with that framing in mind, we had to look at ways in which we can accelerate the academic transition of our students from a secondary to a post-secondary learning experience. And so the focus of our dual enrollment initiative from the academic lens is the ways in which we can improve the learning experience and prepare our students for success. And so in the presentation, you'll see three different strategies that talk about the integrated activity for acceleration of learning, uh, the ways in which we provide students with pathways. And so part of the work of Complete College America helps us in academic affairs to realign our work in terms of completion and pathways, providing our students with opportunities for on-ramps, off-ramps, credentials, and completion. And lastly, providing our students across the P16 spectrum with a clear roadmap to completion one of the top four demotivators of students not completing college is ill-advising and not having a clear roadmap from high school to completion of a baccalaureate degree. 
And so when we look at the framing of our dual enrollment practices, we have to look at policy, we have to look at the practice, and we have to look at the perspective. And some of the <coughs> recommendations and the work that we've been doing aligns to those three concentric circles. First of which, we had to realign our operational work in academic affairs to Complete College America, which includes recommendations on purpose first and guided pathways. When you put a student on a pathway, they now know beginning to end what they must do to complete. We've redesigned our instructional practices to look at faculty development in terms of the P16 vertical alignment, pedagogy, and student success. Teaching high school students is much different from teaching college students. I was a former high school teacher. I taught computer science. Young people learn differently than when I started teaching computer science at the college level. <clears throat> so part of the ways in which we re-envision our instructional practice is through the vertical alignment, working with the middle school, working with the high school, and working with the college to ensure a seamless and succinct uh, pathway of competencies and credentials. Secondly, we are implementing and have implemented faculty and student orientations. We're creating summer bridge programs to provide students a jumpstart opportunity into college as well as acclimate them to the college experience. The research around bridge programs shows us that if a student attends a bridge program, ninth grade, eighth grade through twelfth grade, they are 80% more likely to attend college. If a student takes Algebra two in high school and takes at least six hours of dual enrollment, that goes up to at least 95%. So if we start the student in the pathway earlier, we can ensure success on the end. Um, we've also looked at uh, the creation of new certificate programs that provide students an opportunity for completion. It's not enough for students to take isolated courses. Being on the roadmap to completion, the students can see their journey. And then we're hiring a new professional to connect all of our offices, expand the P16 vertical teaming, and also invite our uh, P16 teachers to our faculty development at the college. Awesome, and I'm gonna have one of our, call him my star principal, um, Dr. Gordon Ford. He's the executive director of Lincoln Prep. He's going to tell you in one minute or less, what they're doing exciting at Lincoln Prep. Thank you all so much for having us here today, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President. We're excited at Lincoln Prep to be a part of this program. Um, Lincoln Prep is at Grambling. We are the former Grambling Laboratory School converted to, a dual, converted to a charter school in 2016, and our mission statement is there. The biggest thing is we offer the entire catalog. We offer master articulation courses, non non-master articulation courses as well as remediation courses and certification courses. The biggest thing about what we do that's different is we have a unique co-teaching model. SUSLA provides a college instructor, we provide a high school instructor, they collaborate and teach together which makes this a model that can be used at any high school in the state with any student which then gives the potential now for dual enrollment to not be measured in the hundreds but be measured in the thousands because the SUSLA instructor does not need any secondary credentials and the, and the Lincoln Prep teacher or the high school teacher does not need any college credentials. It requires a lot of collaboration and your team and our team collaborate daily in a great way to do this. Our first students are about to graduate. Dr. Ellis will be on our campus next month at our graduation pr um, presenting associate degrees to our high school graduates and we are very excited about that. We're continuing to increase those. We're working with, uh, with SUSLA to match more of our certification programs with the state and Jumpstart, as well as pushing the state's um, K-12 hierarchy and the Accountability Commission to give more points and more incentives toward not only dual enrollment, but the use of your college remediation courses to prepare students for high school. Thank you so much. Prepare students for college. Thank you so much. I'm really proud of these folks that I get to work with every day. And uh, thank you, Chancellor, for your leadership and guidance. Are there any questions that I may be able to answer? <coughs> Members, any questions? Just a statement, if you will, Mr. Certainly. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank this group for doing such an admirable job with this task. Uh, as you may remember, when I first came back on this board well, two years ago, uh, one of the first initiatives that I spoke about was the dual enrollment program. We met with this group, I believe, in January of this year. Uh, we 
ask him if you would consider developing a program that could be and would be a template for everybody else in the state of Louisiana to use. And from what I've seen and what I've heard, Dr. Williams and the team, I submit to you, Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, mm -hmm. I think they nailed it. Yeah. Great job. Thank Great you. Job. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Dr. Ellis has set the bar real high here. <laughs> we will uh, we'll go now to uh, uh, Dr. Ammon. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, honorable members of the board. Uh, I am going to give the presentation uh, for SUNO and, and the uh, presentation that I'm going to give is, is not an extensive one, but it's one that has um, given us uh, great concern, but also uh, some great insight. And uh, what we have determined is that dual enrollment is key to sooner reaching its en enrollment goals. We had uh, 11 schools that we were partnering with back in the fall of 2019. And in the fall of 2020, we set an all-time record for dual enrollment students enrolled at the university, 478 students. While it was a record for SUNO, being in the city of New Orleans, the state's largest city, this number is far too low. More importantly, when we took a look at spring of 2021, the number of students enrolled in dual enrollment at the institution uh, declined significantly. Uh, we lost two schools and we even lost upward bound on our own campus. So we have done an analysis. Uh, we are working with the superintendent of schools uh, in New Orleans. Uh, we have set a new goal for SUNO's dual enrollment. <clears throat> and again, working with the superintendent of schools and the principals or the CEOs, um, as they are called in, in New Orleans schools, we have developed a set of retention and growth strategies uh, for the institution. And those are on, on the slide there. And because of the importance of dual enrollment to <clears throat> the institution, but also to the system and to the goals that have been set forth in the master plan uh, for the Board of Regents, we have developed these goals and these strategies. So we're going to continue to develop partnerships with um, school, schools and school districts. Again, 11 schools being the maximum number of schools that we have, as an institution, had a partnership with in New Orleans, again, is just far too low. So we're creating outreach with parents of students at uh, area high schools, providing parent and student information sessions. We're cross-training our admission staff, special events for guidance counselors uh, throughout the region. And we are improving our relationships with these counselors, teachers, and administrators uh, across the region. We are now, uh, we just um, uh, brought on board our new uh, vice chancellor for institutional advancement, which has, she has the responsibility for marketing and recruiting, recruitment materials. And so we're developing new materials that we will be sharing, and we also have the re-engagement of faculty and staff in the recruitment of our regular students, but also in the recruitment of dual enrollment students. But again, we are very fortunate that we have a Jaguar as a superintendent of schools in New Orleans, and he and his team have committed uh, to soon know their cooperation 
and enthusiastic support of SUNO in increasing the numbers of students who come to us uh, for dual enrollment. So Mr. Chair, members of the board, that concludes my report and any questions, I, I will take them. Thank you, Dr. Ammons. Colleagues, any questions? Mr. Uh, Fondale. Yes, Dr. Ammons, thank you for your presentation. And I probably should ask it of Dr. Williams beforehand. Is there any expense to the students as a, with regards to being involved in this program? Well, it depends on the schools. Um, there are some schools who have the resources. Uh, one of the things that we have uh, found uh, as we have been looking at this, and you will see on our report, in fact, there were some students at SUNO uh, whose parents paid uh, for their involvement in, in dual enrollment. As a suggestion, is there a way the, these particular school districts can assist? Is there a certain amount of money that you believe should be set aside so as to not create an expense to some maybe underserved families that are in our communities in these school districts? What would you possibly suggest? Well, you know, we've even had these conversations at the uh, system, at the uh, Council of, of Academic Officers for the systems across Louisiana, <clears throat> because it's all of our goal to increase access to dual enrollment. And we have had conversations around the financial support for dual enrollment. This is a top priority. Uh, for the academic uh, council uh, across the Louisiana systems. So we have given our input uh, to uh, the commissioner, to the staff, to the Board of Regents regarding the importance of finance and also to making certain that we don't put up barriers to access from an academic standpoint uh, to students who want to participate in dual enrollment, things like the ACT, uh, and using other methods to identify students who could, in fact, participate. But the financial issue is one that is a high priority uh, for us. How far back does your program go? Does it is it uh, eighth, ninth graders, or mainly uh, high school students? Uh, well, for us, uh, tenth uh, through twelfth. Tenth through twelfth. And I'll have further discussions with you on it. Thank you very much for your presentation. That concludes your question, Mr. Fondale? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go in this order, Mr. Garvey, Dr. Whitfield, and Ms. Williams. I will tell you, each school district in this state receives an 8G allocation that, that, co that allows them to cover the cost of dual enrollment for students. One problem, Mr. Fondale, is that there is great disparity between the school districts that pay the full, the total cost of dual enrollment for some of their students, and then some of them have a scale where they pay a percentage of it. Right. And I really believe that it ought to be a legislative fix for this to mandate that at least a minimum amount of the money that's allocated to a district is spent on dual enrollment per child. Now, clearly, if you've got more students that, uh, uh, the, the demand is greater than the amount of revenue that they have, then maybe they can prioritize some of those students based on their uh, free and reduced lunch eligibility and that kind of thing. But I know East Baton Rouge Parish, unless they have changed it, they pay the total cost for a student to enroll in a dual enrollment program where there was no out-of-pocket ex expense to the kid. Uh, and so there is great disparity, and some of these families don't have a lot of money, right? And in the order of priority in terms of eating and, you know, food, clothing, shelter, when they have to make those kinds of decisions. But uh, Dr. T uh, uh, Am uh, uh, Belton is telling me that there's a bill that's being currently considered in the legislature that does just that. And part of my question was just an idea as to the amount of how much it would cost. I don't yeah. know if it's 100, 200, 300. Just an idea, and, and I, I guess you've had some experience in that. Mm -hmm. yeah, is there a cost that maybe yeah, someone the, here that can, uh, that can address uh, that? Just to give me an idea. Yeah, the cost varies. Yeah, I'm sorry, the cost varies. I think there's a difference in cost, say, if you're going to LSU BR, uh, if you're going to Southern BR. It's not, 
that much of a variance. But I, I, what's, for example, Dr. Ammons, what's your per unit cost for a kid that's going to enroll in, in, in a dual enrollment course? That's 100 uh, at SUNO, uh, but it's different at SUBR. Yeah. Is that per course or is that for the entire program for a semester? And how do you break it down into semesters or it's over a period of time? That's one per of semester. Questions. Per semester. Okay. Right. All right. I just think it's a great program. Uh, uh, Mr. Gilliam, I know he's brought it up, uh, uh, but it's an excellent way for us to kind of lock in students or at least get them, show them what it looks like to be enrolled in a university program that they can look forward to moving towards. So uh, I, I, again, I'll have continued conversations with you and maybe in my area of Louisiana, hoping to advance that. Thank you. We'll go to Mr. Garvey, then Dr. Whitfield, Ms. Williams, and then Mr. Bartholomew. Mr. Garvey. Chancellor Aaron, thank you again. Um, one of my questions I have for you in, in terms of, um, you mentioning that you wanted to increase your dual enrollment, and do you have a projected uh, goal, and, and when, when do you think that will be met? Um, and also, uh, are there MOUs that you can establish with these high schools within the regions, or do, you do multiple, because I'm assuming not just SUNO, you're competing with other undergraduates that have dual enrollment as well. And so do, can a high school have multiple MOUs with several institutions is one of my questions I would like to ask you. Okay, so in terms of, of the goal, I, I just took a look at these numbers um, uh, recently and all of the numbers that I have seen thus far associated with um, SUNO in my opinion are too small. Uh, so we had our highest of 478 in the fall of 20. Uh, we're now down to 240. And I know why uh, those numbers uh, decreased. We now have a new um, student affairs leadership team coming on and I've spoken with them. But I don't see why we couldn't have a thousand students uh, at the university over a period of time. It, it makes a lot of sense for where we are and what we should be doing. Yes, and, and in response to your other question, can we have relationships with multiple schools? Definitely. And schools outside of, for us, outside of Orleans Parish. I mean, we have neighboring parishes that we, we haven't scratched the surface yet. And because of the name recognition of SUNO uh, and the admiration that that region has for the institution, we should be doing far more. We've had a couple of things on our plate that didn't allow us to focus all of our attention on dual enrollment at the current time, but we're bringing in this new team and they would definitely be focused. And like I said, we got a, a great superintendent of Orleans Parish and the other parishes, neighboring parishes have reached out to us. And so we'll, you'll see more uh, agreements and participation across the region. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chancellor. And to just piggyback <coughs> on you, Chairman, um, myself and, and, and all the Southern University System presidents attended our cost meeting last last um, April the 14th in regards to um, the Board of Regents is really looking at increasing the amount of money that is faced in, uh, in dual enrollment. I know that the Commissioner, Dr. Reed, she stands highly in favor of, of increasing and, and getting money access to, to dual enrollment status. So I'm, I'm very advantageous about the bill that President Belton has said um, because I think so, if we can start, you know, and I can kind of show my age, and a, a lot of you guys, I mean, we, we would sit on here, there wasn't a dual enrollment when we was in high school, or at least it wasn't in my area of high school. And so, in terms of allowing students to go ahead and get a kickstart, um, could only do two things. It one, shows them access and shows them viability early in terms of higher ed, and also get them to being able to say that, hey, this is a place that Southern built me in terms of me graduating and getting my high school, I most likely will highly matriculate and getting my four year and, and, and beyond degrees with Southern. So um, I look forward into all the, the campuses, both Sesla and Suno, 
and, and VR in, 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 in terms of dual enrollment. I think that's a niche in terms of when we talk about student enrollment and increasing student enrollment, that's a thing that it's real easy to, for us to pick up. And so I'm, I'm excited to see how that transforms in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Whitfield. Uh, Dr. Ammons, you mentioned an increase in the spring. How, how did you achieve that increase? No, we had a decrease in the spring. Decrease in spring. Yeah, we, we increased um, in, in the fall. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the fall, I'm sorry. Yes, we, we had an increase in the fall, and again, we were, you know, just getting on the ground. We had um, tremendous leadership uh, in that regard from uh, Dr. Williams, um, Melville Williams, who we borrowed from uh, Sussler uh, for a while. And, and again, the work that uh, she and her team did in, in getting out to the schools in, in New Orleans, even in this virtual um, environment that, we in, that we're in, and the relationship that we had with the superintendent, okay. um, the counselors, the uh, heads of the charter schools, um, you know, and again, uh, that's what it's going to take. Uh, we have to have those direct relationships um, in the schools and with the leaders, the guidance counselors, um, if this is going to work. And we're, we're dedicated to making it work. Thank you, uh, Doc. Thank you. Ms. Williams? Yeah, I just wanted to give uh, Dr. Ammons and his team credit um, for the, their efforts in dual enrollment. The New Orleans region is very different from any in the state of Louisiana. Right. They have all different, they have like 26 charter systems that he's having to deal with to go to to be able to grow his dual enrollment program. So to even be able to sustain the students that he was able to get is admirable because it's like you have this charter school system, that charter school system. They don't really have a school system that you can go after, so he has to cultivate all those different relationships. And I think with the new bill that's passing and then with the emphasis that people have on dual enrollment now, especially the commissioner, that you're gonna see an uptick at uh, Southern University of New Orleans, as well as, like you said, pulling from not just Orleans Parish, but Plaquemines Parish and Jefferson Parish as the like. But it's difficult because of the way their school system is structured. So he's doing a great job with with the hand that he's being dealt. I've always been a supporter of, uh, of dual enrollment, and I know that it's been around for a while. And if we get the message into the schools, it can lend to how that student is a success. My daughter, as an example, I use her all the time when I'm selling dual enrollment myself. She graduated from high school as a sophomore in college with $280,000 worth of scholarship. I haven't paid a quarter. She graduated from Tulane and Kim and Dan uh, Xavier in December, chemistry and chemical engineering. But her base was Fletcher with dual enrollment. So with the support and a stronger s a school system, he can be uh, successful. It's just admirable that he's where he is now and that that school system in the city of New Orleans is very different from anywhere across the state. So I just commend you for the work that your team is doing, Dr. Ammons. Thank you. All right, Mr. Bartholomew, did you have your? Yeah, just a comment. Uh, Dr. Allen's, uh, Melba started the program at Phoenix about 15 years ago. She was the one to initiate the, uh, the program at Phoenix High School where I was a principal. And it, was work, it worked real well. And what happened, our students were able to get honor courses out of and credits based on the appropriation that the school, the state, state Department of Education was appropriating to each district. So on our end, it was already done and paid for because the appropriation covers the credit that the students would get anyway. So the money was there. It just on uh, University of Suno's uh, part, they may have issues with the travel and cost of that with the material and the cost of that to implement the program. But now, with that coming to the new schools now, it offered them an opportunity to receive the qualification that is needed for the achieving scholarship. Uh, diploma through that concept of uh, that program. I mean, they can really get that accreditation on a high school diploma. So I, I, I encourage you to work hard with that, continue doing what you're doing. Yes, sir. Thank you.
Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Allen? All right. Seeing none, we'll go to Dr. Sahu. Um, Honorable Chair, Mr. President, and Board of uh, Supervisors, for interest of time, we will not go into the details of the philosophy and approach and our commitment to dual enrollment. Um, it has been so well presented by our constituent campus leaders, both at Sasla and Suno. But I just want you to get an additional perspective. I will call on the Vice Chancellor of Student Success or our designee to make the presentation for SUBR. Um, but this week I read a comprehensive research report that I'll be happy to summarize and share the findings. Uh, it clearly says, and it m matches very well with our HBCU mission of expanding access, affordability, and student success. It clearly states that students who participate in dual enrollment, they are more likely to attend college and they're more likely to persist and stay in college and graduate at a timely basis. But with this pandemic, we also have another opportunity, positive thing that has happened. Now we are more comfortable and high school students, elementary school students also are now more proficient, more comfortable, you know, in terms of multiple modes of instruction. It does not have to be in a college campus or a high school campus. We just heard that we can teach the class in the high school or we can bus them and bring them to our campus. But we also can provide a hybrid environment where the faculty is at another location and providing that instruction to the student either in the high school or a place of their choosing. I think that's an opportunity for us at the system level, at least at the Baton Rouge level, to take this at a statewide you know, mandate to provide dual enrollment you know, opportunity to the students. And one of the things that we are doing and will do continue is to make sure that those districts or those parishes that are, don't have the resources, the kind of the other parishes are not left out from dual enrollment. You know, that's what we are seeing. That's an uneven distribution of dual enrollment participation in the state. And I think your leadership and the legislative body's leadership will go a long way to make sure that students in every parish you know, who qualify, who want to have access to dual enrollment. Um, I will request uh, our Vice Chancellor for Student Success or her designee to provide you just with the update with the numbers rather than go into everything that you heard about the benefit of dual enrollment and the approach we are doing, they're very similar. So uh, I'll call on Dr. Jacqueline Priestley uh, to make the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sahu. Uh, for those of whom I've not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Jacqueline Priestley, and I serve at SUBR um, as the Vice Chancellor for Enrollment Management and Student Success, and this is my eighth month this month serving in this capacity. I've had the awesome opportunity of working with Dr. Kamesha Smith-Ross, who heads up the dual enrollment um, program, which is a part of the um, outreach programs um, unit at our in our division and so I will give her the opportunity to come forward and talk about the dynamic work that she and Dr. Donovan Segura have done in our dual enrollment program. She'll talk to you about the trends and our enrollment numbers for dual enrollment, um, our strategic initi initiatives and our uh, plan for uh, the year coming and uh, recommendations for sustainability and growth in our program. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, um, Dr. Priestley, for that introduction. Um, I am equally as excited to report about um, dual enrollment and some of our findings um, as we have taken a look at a four-year fall spring enrollment analysis. And um, Dr. Renee is actually passing around. A brochure for you all. Okay, so if you take a look, you can see that in fall of 2017, we were um, at approximately 156 students. Three years in, we have increased our enrollment fall 2020 to 582 students. 
I think what's most admirable about our increase is that if you take a look at the Imagine 20K strategic plan um, for 2018 to 2030, we have outpaced our targets um, for the 2020 fall um, year. So the Baton Rouge campus is doing a phenomenal job with um, dual enrollment and onboarding schools. We have established uh, currently 12 MOUs and the number of high school partnership, partnerships equal 21. Some of the parish networks that we um, work with are East Baton Rouge Parish, East Feliciana, Lafayette, um, Rapides, St. Landry, and St. Mary Parishes. Um, also, what I'd like to share with you all is that in the fall of um, 2018 to the fall of 2019, we saw 121% increase. And of course, we've continued to grow an additional 40% in the fall of 2020. Some plans for growing our dual enrollment program. We anticipate that we're going to continue to expand our interactions with our high schools. Um, through additional articulation agreements, we have currently um, had conversations with approximately five additional high schools um, throughout the state of Louisiana. As a result, we know that our fall numbers are going to continue to blossom. Um, there are quite a few educational sites that we are providing instruction um, to our students and without them having to physically come to our campus. Um, that has indeed been a benefit to um, high school students because of the pandemic. And so as a result of that, them not having to physically come to the campus has been a benefit um, to us. We will continue to provide courses in a blended format, whether it's through a hybrid model or even um, online. Um, if there is a desire for students to come face to face, we will indeed take um, a second look at that um, process for the fall, ensuring that we are not putting any student at harm's way. And then last, I think that um, with that being said, we're continuing to recruit. Um, our senior recruiter, Dr. Donovan Segura, and I are working tirelessly to make sure that we can encourage and offer um, this opportunity to many students and to grow the pipeline. Um, on the Baton Rouge campus. Some sustainability requisites that are critically important to this growth that we're seeing is that um, we're in need of a budget. We're um, also going to focus on hiring some additional staff and admissions counselor, uh, registration counselor, additional recruiters, um, coordinators, and then of course a branding campaign is also needed. Um, if there are any additional questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. If not, thank you so much. Mr. Garvey. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm looking over this strategic plan, and I'm impressed um, in terms of how you guys are increasing um, your numbers. Um, I know, again, from Dr. Donovan Siguri, he, he's done a tremendous job recruiting. I've seen him personally within the East Baton Rouge system. Um, such a tremendous jewel for this university. Um, and, and some of the things is, and not a, dis, not a discourse to the other campuses, but some of these, we're one system. And so you having great success, you know, it would be great to talk to some of the other, other systems as well to see if you can provide some of the strategic plans that you have done, so done yourself and Mr. Seguri have done to increase the, 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 the numbers here. Um, do you have a, another projection of where you want to go in the next uh, academic year in terms of enrollment? So um, actually, yeah, there are some projections out there. Um, as I mentioned previously, our Imagine 20K strategic plan defines those project projections um, for us. Um, but I can tell you that we're going to definitely exceed our fall 2020 enrollment. Um, I anticipate we'll be um, very close to 1,000 students come fall 21. Wonderful. Thank you. Questions? Mr. Fondue. Dr. Ross, the question I have is, are the credits transferable? Let's say, for example, the student stays in the program for a year or two and they decide that they don't want to come to Southern, is it, or is it exclusive just to Southern? 
No, sir. Um, so there is an articulation agreement in the state of Louisiana whereby it states that those credits, dual enrollment credits, can be transferable to any state college or university in the state of Louisiana. I can also add, though, from my personal experience with, with my son, um, he did have dual enrollment credit in the state of Louisiana, and he elected to go out of state to another historically black college and university, and those credits did transfer. So we tell our students, if you elect not to come to Southern University, make sure you allow whichever university you select outside of the state, if that is where you're going, to evaluate your transcripts, because there are universities who will um, accept those credits. Have you seen an, an uptick since the COVID with regards to the virtual? I heard you mention it earlier. Has that given us an opportunity? I know a lot of times students are thinking that they have to go to classes, but since the COVID has been there and everything has gone virtual, have you seen a, a, a big uptick in the number of students that are applying? So I think for our students, many of them would like the face-to-face -face, um, experience just because they want to come to the college campus to see what that experience is like. Um, because we are in a pandemic, it makes it a little different, and they don't want to forego the opportunity to gain that credit. And so as a result of that, um, you know, students as well as schools encouraged them to participate in an online platform. But if students had a choice, they would definitely come to the college campus. Even, even the students that are outside of our area, let's say, for example, somebody up in, uh, we are up in this area, Minden or Maine, mm -hmm. they would still be able to be a part of the program even though they're miles away. Yes, sir. Um, they can elect to um, enroll at Southern University Baton Rouge campus um, if that is what they in fact want to do. We don't recruit um, this far north, and we don't recruit um, too far south just because of our sister institutions. So we want to be fair to them and um, not go into their territory. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Smith Ross, for the presentation. Dr. Priestley, Dr. Thank you. Sahu. Okay. Mr. Chair, if I oh, may, sorry, I, I just wanted to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Uh, Kamisha Ross and, and the team uh, for the exponential growth that has occurred uh, on, on the Baton Rouge campus. I'm not sure if you're aware, uh, but uh, Southern University of Baton Rouge served more students in East Baton Rouge than any other institution to include uh, LSU uh, and uh, Baton Rouge uh, Community College. I think it's also appropriate to uh, congratulate uh, both Suno and Susla, you know, for their efforts. You may recall, Mr. Chair, that this board in and of itself challenged us to bring a concerted and deliberate focus on dual enrollment. And, and I think there is, in fact, evidence to give indication that we have uh, uh, heard uh, uh, that charge and, and we are actually advancing it. Very so good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Thank you. We'll go now to informational item C update on the uh, Southern University Law Center legal education in the Shreveport, Bossier, and Northwest region. Chancellor Pierre. Yes, uh, good afternoon. You uh, were passed out a packet uh, from our off campus instructional site team on the work that we're doing with respect to the Southern University uh, Shreveport uh, uh, Educational uh, Legal Education Pathway. I'm gonna ask uh, Professor Alfred, who is the director of our off-campus instructional site, to come and do a brief presentation. She actually is, um, today we're doing a outreach with our constituents as part of this program at one o'clock. So I'm gonna ask her to do brief and then I'll follow up so that she can be on time with her big event today. <laughs> so if you'll, you'll look in the envelope, you'll see the, 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 the information. Good afternoon. To the honorable chairman and members of the board, thank you for this honor and privilege to present before you on this day. I am humbled as a Shreveport native with family connections from Allendale to Moortown to Cooper Road. 
earning credit hours from SUSBO to Southern University to Southern University Law Center to Georgetown University Law Center, I'm home with the goal to pay it forward. I'm reflective on a moment with my grandmother sitting on a porch before I left for college. She said to me with a stern look, don't let your name beat you back home unless it's good. Today I stand before you with good news. Good news on a 500 page detailed report that I would like to read word for word as the chancellor has a heart attack here. Uh, no, I, I will provide a high level update made possible by a stellar team. Um, chancellor Pierre, facilities Angela Gaines, Rufus Jackson, Felicia Foreman, Kesty Ware, Library, Adrian Shields, Phoebe Poydras, Architect, Danny Williams, Information Technology, Gregory Spira, Lada Johnson, Tremel Williams. I have three main points. The three main points is that we are in phase one of three phases. Phase one subjects us to a semester in Shreveport. That semester in Shreveport will begin spring 2022 and spring 2023. The semester in Shreveport will entail students doing their final year of law school. We will also provide regional learning, employment, and relocation opportunities. Phase two will entail a year in Shreveport for third year Southern University Law Center students. Phase three will expand the OCIS off-campus instructional site to a branch campus a four-year part-time evening weekend 90-hour program designed to serve non-traditional students. My three main points. Phase one planning underway. Planning for the renovations to the Shree Memorial Library is underway. The OCIS leadership team has been conducting consistent on-site visits to the Shree Memorial Library. Our last visit taking on March 26, 2021. The design development drawings are complete. Board members, you have a copy in your package. And to my right, we have an enlarged version for your on display. We are constantly integrating off-campus instructional site requirements for the library, facilities, and IT. Secondly, third year law students from Southern University Law Center will spend their final spring semester attending the OCI branch campus in Shreveport. We are identifying interested students for the spring 2022 and spring 2023. We are collaborating with local leaders for student regional learning employment opportunities and identifying housing options for law students relocating to Shreveport. And thirdly, today, we are about to facilitate the first of a series of virtual meet and greet symposiums that will entail an opportunity for our students to engage with representative leadership uh, to discuss experiential learning and relocation to Shreveport. So we are going to do that as we speak at one to three. Any questions? Any questions, members? Yes, how you doing, Professor Allison? Hi. From, from phase one to phase three, what's the anticipated time frame? Well, phase one is spring 2022. So those students that are in the final year and then we'll wait for spring 2023, those students in their final third year. Then the next year is a year in Shreveport, which is phase two. And phase three is the branch campus. So, so, so that's about, about five years. Five years, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good job. Thank you, thank you. Now, we will move to our system president's report. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, as you, I'm sure, can attest, uh, uh, much has been discussed today, uh, and our time has been well spent. So Good discussion. I, uh, uh, I will not elaborate any further. I would just like to uh, thank uh, Chancellor uh, Ellis and and the Southern University of Shreveport team for facilitating us to here, this here. point. We have a 
another a day in the, in the great metropolitan area of Shreveport uh, where we're going to be hosting the game. And, and certainly, uh, uh, as of yet, uh, this reception has been very warm. Uh, I wanted to uh, 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 measure my comments from here forth. I wanted Dr. Uh, Williams to just share with you ever so briefly uh, our aim to unfold a presidential fellowship program where people have the opportunity of engaging uh, with students. And, and, at, and at, at her, uh, after her comments, uh, my uh, presentation would conclude. Thank you, President Belton, members of the board, and all others who are assembled. Uh, as we continue to capitalize on our legacy of building a next generation of leaders on the Baton Rouge campus, we are very excited to introduce a new program that we are unveiling, and it's our Presidential Fellows. Uh, it's going to kick off in the fall. Um, we're very excited about it. We do um, have Dr. Donovan Segura that's going to be working with us um, on this inaugural cohort. Um, the fellows are actually going to receive a stipend of about $2,000 for participating in the program. Uh, this, this fellowship program will focus on leadership development, academic enrichment, and public service and civic engagement. Um, we are very excited about it. We'll be uh, unveiling our fellows uh, to the board uh, during the July Board of Supervisors meeting, if, uh, if allowed. And uh, we are just very excited about this. We think that this will be a wonderful opportunity for our students to further engage um, uh, during their education, uh, educational pursuits and matriculation. Uh, we will also be tapping some of our um, folks who are experts in those areas. Uh, Dr. Leon Tarver, we hope that you will be able to uh, work with us on this endeavor, um, as we know that we will have students that will be very interested. I thought you were looking for experts. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. <laughs> and so we will, we, will be, we will certainly be working with many other leaders um, that are on this board to um, engage with our students. Uh, they will also be uh, representative of all of the classifications on the Baton Rouge campus, and this is in part underwritten by Verizon. So we are very excited about this, and uh, we hope that you all uh, will embrace this as we move forward again in creating our next generation of leaders. Thank you. Any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Seeing none, thank you, Dr. Uh, Williams, and thank you, uh, Dr. Belton. We'll go now to our campus reports, beginning with Dr. Ammons. Thank you, Mr. Chair, <coughs> uh, members of the board, uh, President Belton, and, and my colleagues. Um, briefly, uh, I just want to um, point out um, just, just a few things, and you have the packet, um, in, uh, you have the report in your packet. Our faculty continues to engage in research. Our students are being recognized for awards and scholarships. One of our faculty, um, uh, Mr. John Barilou, uh, was just installed as the president of the Louisiana Health Information Management Association. And this one is um, uh, uh, extremely important to the system. You know that we have this partnership with DXC. DXC has funded um, programs uh, at uh, pretty much all of the campuses now. But DXC just made 12 hires, and four of the new hires are SUNO graduates uh, from our computer information systems program. And so I want to, first of all, I want to congratulate DXC. They have an eye for talent. And I want to congratulate our students uh, who would now be new team members uh, at DXC. And Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Ammons. Dr. Ellis. Good afternoon. Uh, just a couple quick things. Uh, one, uh, we've received a, a couple of uh, new uh, National Science Foundation grants as we continue to pursue our quest to improve and expand our engineering program. Uh, we were also awarded uh, $20,000 for the Home Depot 
Retool Your School campaign, uh, along with, I believe, SUDR also received that award um, with the assistance of the uh, Southern alumni as well as our, our campus. And then finally, I uh, just want to thank my team. For those of you all that are still remaining uh, here, if we just briefly stand up uh, so that uh, the board can see you. And uh, again, there's been a lot of effort uh, put into uh, ensuring uh, that this was a successful board meeting um, uh, and uh, reception and hopefully uh, next couple of days. So thank you um, for coming and sharing with us. Uh, and we look forward to the entire weekend. That concludes my report. Dr. Ellis, I know I speak for the entire board when we say thank you to you and your staff who are here today. And I know a lot of work has gone into uh, making certain that things run very smoothly this weekend, and we certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. McMean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, also, President Belton and honorable board members and my colleagues. Um, I want to, first of all, thank you for approving the MOU entitled SU uh, East Baton Rouge Parish Schools uh, 1890 Jag Star Scholarship Program, MOU. Uh, this is a very unique articulation agreement, uh, and it comes off of the tales of the new 1890 uh, scholarship program that was passed under the most previous farm bill where each 1890 will receive a half a million dollars, a minimum of a half a million up to a million per school uh, per year. And what's so unique about this articulation agreement is that it will provide uh, uh, we're making slots for two students per high school in East Baton Rouge uh, parish schools, high schools, guaranteed scholarships. Of course, they have to meet the criteria. And so we'll be given 26 scholarships annually uh, just to East Baton Rouge Parish. And I think this is a big deal. Uh, and and uh, there'll be full and partial scholarships. And I want to thank Dr. Anita Marshall, if she's still here, uh, for her efforts. In, in working that out, and we have plenty enough uh, resources also to try to recruit from around the state and throughout the country. So I want to uh, thank the board for approving that MOU. I think it's definitely going to impact our enrollment in the College of Ag and develop that pipeline in, in agriculture. We, uh, we are not meeting the challenges of, of uh, employing or graduating enough individuals uh, in agriculture, and that is not necessarily a Louisiana issue, that's a national if not an international issue. So we think this will definitely uh, positively impact that. Uh, secondly, uh, July 1, 2021 uh, makes 20 years since the establishment of the uh, Southern University Ag Center. Uh, because of the pandemic, um, we've had to put off some of the activities, uh, but we're already establishing a speaker series. And I want to thank Dr. Tarver for being one of the first individuals to agree to be a part of that speaker series. We will also have Dr. Leodre Williams, uh, we're gonna invite Dr. Belton, of course, and others to be a part of that, but, uh, and also we're going to include students. But we're very, very excited about uh, uh, the activities that are gonna be associated with the 20th uh, anniversary. And uh, more information will be uh, forthcoming. And last but not least, this is, a, this is really, really good news. Last week, we were contacted by the uh, USDA and notified that we, uh, were granted the uh, designation of a USDA 1890 Center of Excellence. That is very, very difficult. <laughs> and the, the name of the center is the Center of Excellence for Nutrition, Health, Wellness, and Quality of Life, and will focus on underserved minority communities. Uh, I, I know I will be talking to at least one or two board members in here about how we are going to implement that. And we are the lead university uh, the amount is $1.7 million. Uh, the other great thing about that, uh, by us being the, the lead institution, the other uh, HBCUs are North Carolina a and and uh, Tuskegee. So I've been getting at the other deans and bragging about the fact that we were designated the lead university. And we are negotiating right now to double that amount of money under the current USDA administration to $3.4 million. So we are truly excited about that, and we will start rolling that out in the next couple of weeks. And that concludes my report. Very good. Thank you, Dr. McMeans. Chancellor Pierre. Good afternoon. Yes. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, thank the board for, again, providing us the, the support and resources for the things that we need at Southern University Law Center. 
Uh, one quick announcement. Uh, Donald Cravens Jr., one of our alums, uh, will become the next executive vice president and chief operating officer for the National Urban League. Uh, that's a big deal. He and I talked about it. I said, soon you'll be Louisiana's Whitney Young uh, uh, and, and Vernon Jordan all in one. So he's, he's coming there real soon. I want to uh, defer to Dr. Whitfield to introduce Chris Turner, who will present very briefly some exciting things we're doing pipelining with the lab school. And if, if the board will indulge us, we'd like to do a more elaborate presentation next month because we are, we're about to, uh, to roll into some very important opportunities with Generation Esports. Dr. Whitfield. Thanks, uh, Ms. Perry. So guys, I, I'm not into the video games and stuff like these young people are. They do call me the hip hop doc, but it's not for that reason. But um, <laughs> when Chris talked to me about this esports thing, I was like, what are you talking about? And just a little bit about Chris. Chris is an art teacher at, at Southern University Laboratory School. He's a, he's a personal friend, and he's also a, a tremendous uh, teacher at the, unit, at, the, at the school. And so he's created this vibe at the school that's just going crazy. The kids are really engaged. He's doing this thing called esports. He's got some national attention about it. And so I just want to bring Christopher Turner uh, in front of you guys today just to share a little bit about what he's doing at the school. And, and, and it's really taken off. And it's, it's, it's well, Chris, tell him what's going on. <laughs> no problem. Uh, thank you, uh, President, Chair, Vice Chair, and Board members. Um, I get this question all the time, what is esports? Esports is competitive gaming. Engaging students in esports can help them build critical thinking skills and encourage teamwork and innovation and promote self-dedication and learning. Uh, a couple of collegiate esports facts. There are uh, 186 collegiate esports programs in the country. 16 million college scholarships were distributed to high school students in 2018 and 2019. All the uh, scholarships were from educational institutions looking to recruit and expand upon esports programs, enhancing and recruitment and retention, offering an opportunity for great uh, recognition and promise to esports programs generated multiple streams of revenue. In 2018, Ashland University esports program was featured on Good Morning America. It attracted 500 applications. Career pathways within esports can create lasting programs and career opportunities in Southern University students. Some of the academic links, computer science, engineering, business studies, entrepreneurship, Multi multimedia and law are some of, some of those. Southern's lab esports program accomplishments in the last two years. 40 students in the program, 10 are competing for scholarships, one National High School Esports League title, two runner-up titles. National title, one of Troy Mur Murphy won $1,000 in scholarship. Um, the opening of the esports media lab was a $40,000 project and upgrades. It was funded through grants, donations, and partnerships. Southern Lab graduates receiving internships uh, with Generation Esports, as Chancellor Pierre mentioned. Southern University Esports program since September 2019. 67 active student members, $5,000 in money has been awarded to winning students, in kind prizes such as laptop, computers, and headsets. Program has been featured in multiple news channels, local, national, and and uh, throughout. Um, we're in a development relationship with EA that has led to entrepreneurship opportunities, ten thousand dollars scholarships in computer science to the computer science department, and sponsorships and support. Southern University inaugural esports summit that took place uh, virtually through the law center was an inactive of the mixed reality and virtual innovation game in the Esports Institute. Uh, the summit was successfully viewed by hundreds. Three uh, $250 prize, uh, prizes were awarded to Southern University students through Generation Esports and East EA Sports also provided student uh, gaming codes. Uh, in closing, I'd like to thank Dr. Belton, uh, the Vice Chancellor, Chair, uh, Pierre, Dr. Whitfield, 
for Dr. Brewster, um, most important for supporting esports thus far? So, board members, and I'll just say this briefly the, the esports industry is, is valued at about $1.5 billion. I think it was 2016, 2017, there were only maybe 60 colleges. There are now 63, I mean, six, 16 colleges. There are 63 institutions now that are doing this esports program. So it's a growing thing. It's something that's new. It's innovative. And we appreciate what you're doing at the school and uh, what you and, and Mr. Brister are doing at the school. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. I've always wondered how my youngest son could potentially monetize his excessive <laughs> video. <laughs> so this <laughs> well, <laughs> may well, need to make him watch this presentation. <laughs> Ch Ch Chairman Rutledge, if, if we are fortunate and, and we have turned it into an opportunity for intellectual property, uh, business development, actually for law students to monetize and hopefully we'll be able to turn it into the whole system monetizing this whole thing. Interesting. Thank you very much for Thank your you. presentation. Thank you. Dr. Sahu. Mr. Chairman, I'll try to see if I can finish Last within two but not minutes. Least. <laughs> two, two minutes so that you can end your program uh, before one o'clock or right at one o'clock. Yes, sir. Um, I'm not going to belabor what's already included in your package in terms of the report for SUBR. But I just want to, at the outset, thank uh, you, Mr. President, and member of the board, uh, members of the board, uh, for your recognition of the equity adjustment that was needed, and that recognition that more adjustments needed in terms of market and performance, both for the administrators and the faculty on our campus. That's how we will be able to retain, recruit, retain, and develop talent so that they can all be committed to the uh, you know, to a student learning environment that is inclusive and that is caring and that is also competent. I want to also bring to your attention that thank you so much for approving many of the policies and processes. We're trying to implement the existing policies and have before you approve any changes or any additions to them. And yet we are also strengthening processes on our campus. I want to acknowledge Dr. Peening and his unit in terms of having a five-year window where we are going to look at on a continuous basis all the policies that are there. That's how we will show progress in terms of how we manage and how we govern ourselves. I want to end by asking you to, inviting you to attend our commencement on May 14th, uh, which will be in person. Your presence will mean a lot to the families and to the graduates. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sahu. And uh, before we adjourn, I want to uh, recognize our athletic director. Come on up here to the, to the microphone, uh, to the podium rather, and um, who is a proud native son of this city. And I know he's very excited along with Dr. Belton to bring the Bayou Classic to Shreveport. I think you have an activity tonight, uh, Mr. Athletic Director, if you'll just give us some brief details about uh, your activity tonight and how many points we expect to win by tomorrow, we'd certainly appreciate it. <laughs> Briefly. Odin's on the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no doubt about it. Uh, greetings to everyone and uh, just want to say an encouraging word to everyone that uh, I know the mayor's not here and you all said it yesterday, but we want to thank the city of Shreveport, uh, my hometown, uh, Dr. Belton hometown. Uh, Dr. Tarver hometown. There's been a lot of good things to come out of here, and I'm just the youngest one. <laughs> uh, but uh, no question about it, in a time where we are searching for a place, they came to our rescue, and this has been a great partnership. Uh, but we do look uh, forward um, later this year in November to return back down south to its original place. Um, there's a, we are hosting the athletic department through my lens is hosting an activity today and uh, I'll make sure to share with all you all about location uh, via text through uh, Ms. Tracy and I uh, look forward to seeing everybody there but we're encouraging everybody to relax and enjoy themselves and we're looking forward uh, to game time tomorrow. Uh, we are excited, uh, our fan base is excited about being in North Louisiana for this Bayou Classic. The last time this game was played here was in, no, uh, in 73. In 73, there were so many people in the stadium, they had to move it to New Orleans, and that started the Bayou Classic. And so it was the original Grambling and Southern game in 73. But once again, we're looking forward to be loud and proud and those Jaguars come in town and cheer ourselves on to a victory and hopefully that we make it all the way to a championship. And like I say, we don't have the jukebox, but we got all of us in Odom's and the crew is on the way.
All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I just want to say that, that I was at that 73 uh, game, and uh, I drove the Coach Bates and his wife back home from here to my wife. And that's where the idea to buy you classic on that drive back. So that Charles Bates went to see uh, Dean Jones that Monday, and the Bayou Classic were hats. Now, a lot of Southern life may not know that, and don't y'all shoot me for telling you that, but that's how it was hats. Well, we will have to make certain that the history reflects that Dr. Davis was the <laughs> genesis. Let the record reflect. Bayou Classic in New Orleans. <laughs> I moved Dr. We, Leroy <laughs> Davis Bayou Classic is what I moved. Yeah. We may even rename it the Leroy Davis Bayou Classic. <laughs> Uh, I'm, not, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not looking for any credit. I just want to say, yes, sir. We understand. There are people who are not here. <laughs> we got like our halftime interview in tomorrow. Bates yes, sir. We that understand. Has this Bayou Classic. Yes, sir. I just was the driver. Yes, sir. <laughs> you remember like driving Miss Davis? I was just the driver. <laughs> Well, we thank you for that information, and thank you, uh, Athletic Director Roman Banks, doing an outstanding job. Um, members, before we adjourn, lunch is going to be served in the same place as breakfast. Our May meeting, our May meeting, May 21st, Friday, May 21st, in Baton Rouge, in person. Any other? No, Mr. Lost didn't have anything. He told me, he told me I would go, he was hungry. Any other, any other, any other business? Is there a motion for adjournment? Motion. All right, it's, it's, we stand adjourned.